Welcome everyone to the uh, October 10th meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, I'm Len Carden, Chair, and uh, Jeff Steelman had a work engagement and uh, may be joining later, depending on our, depending on our timing. Uh, Jane Morgan has a family engagement, but will be joining later. Uh, joining us is AEA Rep Juliana Keyes and Arlington High Rep uh, Margot Moore. He is a senior at Arlington High School, and you're welcome to participate and just uh, sort of indicate that you want to have something to say. You need to wait for the microphone to be handed down, and then uh, just so people can hear you at home, and uh, we welcome your participation. All right, so we have more. Uh, we have new art uh, this evening. It is from Arlington High School. So we will start with Board A back there. And uh, on the left side is from the AP Art and Design class, Drawing, 2D Design, and 3D, 3D Design. The AP program in Studio Art and Design is intended for highly motivated students who are seriously interested in the study of art at the college level. The curriculum addresses three major concerns, a selection of the student's best work over two years, a year-long study and the creation of an in-depth portfolio of one central theme, and the study of major movements and art history and influences of various cultures with a focus on contemporary art. On the right side is Ceramic Sculpture and Pottery One. In Ceramic Sculpture and Pottery One at the high school, students are practicing and honing skills of constructing with fire clay to create both functional pottery and sculptural pieces. Mm -hmm. Through lots of practice, students have learned hand building techniques such as pinching, coiling, and slab building, as well as using the potter's wheel. They have recently begun to apply and combine those skills in the creation of more complex work. Students have also begun to explore adding color to work through glazing. Over to B, over here. Uh, this is a selection of individual pieces from Ms. Robola's classes that made up this year's large-scale collaborative in installation in the art hallway of Arlington High School. The theme of the work is the idea of growth. Over 300 students were asked to design, create, and create a piece that visually represents a form of growth, whether it be physical, emotional, organic, or any other kind of growth. All pieces came together to make a large garden-like installation that was intended to celebrate diversity within our community and contribute to an inclusive and welcome learning environment. C, over here. Students in the new course, Drawing One, explored a series of academic skills of observation where they applied different drawing techniques. This included a sequence of drawings focusing on line, edges, space, relationships, and form. Students applied different techniques with charcoal and graphite to render objects from careful observation. This variety of drawings will lay a foundation for the rest of the year. This is also continued on to panel D. Uh, panel D also contains collaborative works mentioned previously for the growth collabor collaboration installation. And then in the back on E, uh, digital photography on display are photos inspired by, a student, by students' family heritage. Students are encouraged to explore multiple aspects of photography. All are expected to develop a personal voice with thoughtful and meaningful expressions through a variety of subject matter and techniques. Many students are attracted to this media, not only because the results are so immediate, but because they seek an, an alternative means of expression. Uh, I guess also over there in display E are Zen tangles, foundations of studio art. A Zen tangle is a complicated looking drawing that is built one line at a time. Simple tangles or, pat or patterns are combined in unplanned ways that grow and change in amazing directions. Also known to help relieve anxiety and stress, and stress, help you focus and relax your body, Zen tangles help to build confidence in one cre one's creative abilities. Thank you to all of the Arlington High School art teachers for putting this together and all of the art students on your wonderful work. Mm -hmm. All right, so next we're going to go to the AHS Service Learning and Cultural Exchange trip. Um, and I believe Mr. Bostis is here to present or ask, answer any questions that we have. So for new trips, we have the sponsors come to us to basically describe, you know, why, they, why they're pursuing this sure. trip. 
Sure. Uh, so this trip uh, it, it was born out of our experience with Arlington running our two South Africa trips that we've taken Arlington uh, students to. Uh, and one, the last trip we took to South Africa, we actually were flying over Puerto Rico just around the time of the hurricane. And what struck me was here we're taking, at that time it was 47 high school students, thousands of miles to go serve the poor in South Africa. If you notice the accent, that's where I'm from. <laughs> Uh, but I'm an American citizen, and I was sitting there going, we're flying over American citizens in need. These kids are going to go do this phenomenal work. They did an amazing job doing what they did, and we began to say, well, what about the need in Puerto Rico? So as a company, we began to explore doing those trips to Puerto Rico. We sent staff members over, got to know people on the ground, got uh, in relationship with a couple of nonprofits there, as well as sending uh, some board members over to resource and sort out a trip that we could offer. And we began to talk to Arlington about that, uh, and we brought an initial trip to the board last year, which you approved. Unfortunately, through some uh, logistical error, we were only informed with three weeks left to the start of the trip, and we're like, there's no way we can pull that off in three weeks. Uh, uh, so we asked for a change in the date. But the purpose of the trip is to do very much the same as what we do in South Africa, which is introducing kids to educational elements that they're experiencing here in their school, but taking them out of the classroom so that they have a different aspect of learning. The way I try to uh, describe it is putting flesh and blood onto your subjects. So uh, they're going to go and do service work in Puerto Rico, uh, working with a, a community called Children of New Hope uh, in Sabana Seca, which is a, a suburb of San Juan, and they'll be working with that nonprofit that reaches about 150 uh, children and doing their work f with them. Whatever that nonprofit needs at the time, uh, what they, we're working with them now is they, they'll be preparing for their summer camp. So they'll be working in the organization, preparing them for their summer camping. Uh, but we tie to the service project learning opportunities so that they would learn the culture, the story, and history of Puerto Rico and begin to dismantle some of the perspectives that people have about seeing Puerto Ricans as second-class citizens, substandard citizens, so bridging those gaps in relationship building so that students, when they come back here, begin to view their environment differently. And we did that in South Africa, where we uh, introduced them to the apartheid structure of South Africa, the first third world system in South Africa, and as happens, kids began to begin to ask themselves, well, are those same uh, elements present back in our school, in our town, in our country, and we're able to break through some of those barriers where some significant conversations can happen. The idea of the Puerto Rico trip is something that's more accessible to more people. It's a cheaper trip. It's closer. I mean, 18 hours of flying is a killer. Uh, four hours, I'll take that any day. Uh, and Liz Morris, as the teacher, is very intrigued by this uh, on a number of different fronts, uh, to bring her teams closer, to make it a, a accessible to more children uh, in the school, uh, and then uh, achieve something great with it that might be something that is an ongoing opportunity as we go through it. The difference between Hammer and Chisel and some of the other tour companies out there, the major difference is that Hammer and Chisel is not a tour company. We don't run lots of tour businesses with other agencies and school trips is one thing we do. We're an education enhancement company, so we try to work with uh, specific schools and specific teachers uh, with them selecting goals for the trips, and then we tailor the trip to those goals. Uh, so our staff go along on the trip. They teach on the trip alongside the teachers. They use opportunities to uh, broaden and widen uh, children's perspectives uh, and bringing some unique elements. So I do the South Africa trip because that's where I grew up, so I have some special insights to that, but other, other staff members provide different aspects to that. So Liz Morris is the key teacher on this trip. I believe she's asked uh, Kevin Toro if he can be uh, the male uh, attendant on the trip. I don't know where she stands with that. Obviously, I have no say in which teachers go, uh, but we'll be sending two staff members along on the trip, our staff members, um, and uh, participating in that. Uh, I'll be doing the South Africa trip, which is also on your docket for approval tonight, uh, which is at the same time. Uh, so we have uh, two Hammond Chisel staff members going to Puerto Rico and two going to South Africa. Um, so that's a, the trip in a brief breakdown. Uh, any questions?
Uh, I was just curious about what are the service opportunities at, in the two places? What do you, what do you expect students to be In doing? Puerto Rico? In Puerto Rico, yeah. Yeah, in Puerto Rico, they'll be working with Sabana Seca, so they're going to be uh, setting up their, uh, preparing for their camps. So they will be doing um, a mixture of classroom preparation, camp preparation work. Uh, we also are trying to do some community work. The details of that haven't been worked out to specifics yet. Uh, but we're looking at taking some students into the Sabana Seca community and working with the elderly. So shut-ins who need visits or yard cleanup, those sorts of things. There'll be two to three service projects uh, uh, spread over th three days. So they won't be working eight till five, but it will be more like a nine till two time frame. Okay. And in South Africa? In South Africa, we'll be working with uh, an organization called Mold Empower Serve. They work with the homeless in the northern suburbs of Cape Town. Uh, so the students will do what they've done on previous trips, a street store where they offer, uh, they set up and run a clothing store for the homeless where the, the students are serving as retail clerks and they guide homeless people who get to choose their clothing. Uh, and then uh, because they choose their clothing, there's dignity in that. Uh, and they don't pay for it, but we wrap it up and bag it uh, for the homeless person, as well as doing other work around the homeless area they have a, a, a nightly shelter that they run. We'll be cleaning that up, uh, perhaps prepping their food bank that they run. And as part of an expanded experience, we'll go to their after-school centers that they run uh, with elementary age kids um, in the afternoons on two of the afternoons. There'll be options to do those. And they get to play with the kids and hang out with them. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, not Mayor? necessarily a question, but I think it would be beneficial for us have the students, when they come back, uh, do a, a small presentation of uh, what they've experienced and stuff. I think it would be good for them mm -hmm. and uh, good for the community. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. As a follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I have one more question. Sorry. Sure. Um, just one more question. So I saw that people can <coughs> donate to a scholarship fund. I know that we have a scholarship fund at the school. Is that, or would students be eligible for that yes. as well? Okay. Yeah. Yes, they would be able to access. And, and we are working with, uh, with the teacher that we can increase the price slightly and add a scholarship to the price so that we can subsidize that. Uh, that's just something that the school needs to say they want us to do, and we can add that onto it. Okay. I, I don't think it's right for us to just start charging more yeah. and call it a scholarship, but if you want us to do that, that's easily accessible. Okay, great. Oh, so, uh, just a question about the contract, which I saw in here, which hadn't seen before. Do we normally sign contracts with the yeah. tour vendors? So we, after you approve it, usually I sign it or... No. Oh, okay. Because mm -hmm. um, we, we had talked about the policy where we were trying to make a distinction mm -hmm. between teacher-sponsored trips mm -hmm. and school-sponsored trips. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I thought we were mainly approving teacher-sponsored trips. Teachers that were, they were coming to us for approval because they were using school resources to you know, promote the trips, mm -hmm. right? But sort of, a, we when you cross the line into a school-sponsored trip, there's liability issues that we really sure. haven't looked at. So, I, do you see these as school-sponsored trips or teacher-sponsored trips? Uh, I don't. The, the reason we ask for a contract with the school or uh, is just so that we can, with our board, mm -hmm. start making good conscious bookings. Right. Because uh, in the past, when we don't have them, you know, teachers can pull out at any minute. There's no financial obligation to that. It just authorizes us to begin the work. Okay. So I don't, I, I work with so many different districts yeah. that uh, they code that differently. So right. I would let you decide which one it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we just need to be kind of authorized to approve mm -hmm. it. Having said that though, we kind of ran into a thing where the flight bookings needed deposits paid ahead of time before the last committee meeting. So we took the risk on that and, and paid the deposits for the, the flights because there was the flight prices in April are just astronomically ridiculous. I got quotes that were literally $2,000 apart per person. And so we wanted to secure the good pricing we had. So we paid for the deposits. They're non-refundable, but we'll take that risk. So, uh, uh, but that's why. Great. I think I mean, we may want to consider looking into some more. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole thing is, is that the, our two issues were one in terms of how of money flowing through the district and as the district paying a large chunk mm -hmm. to a vendor which right. presented legal issues. And then the other was, uh, of course, to ensure that liability is properly assigned. 
So I can answer just from history sure. that we've yeah. done both with Arlington. Our yeah. first South Africa trip, all the money came to the school and then the school paid us money. The second trip we did, we collected all the money and nothing came yeah, through the school, which was a lot that. simpler and yeah. easier. That's, yeah, we tried to get away from that's that. That's the direction we go. That's, that's what we really feel we need to do because the issues with having the money flowing through us. Yeah, it's very, it, it's tough. Yeah. That, it, mm -hmm. that becomes a direct relationship between the student and, and you, and we're just sort of saying, okay, you're a private operator, you're, we're allowing you to talk to our students and recruit them, but it's your trip and not ours. Right, and that's probably how we would view it, is to prefer mm -hmm. doing it that way, because mm -hmm. it also gives us more accessibility to the f financial mm -hmm. oversight of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one last comment, which is really not for, for you, but for the <laughs> administrative team. Um, I'm glad to see a domestic trip, but it's still an expensive domestic trip, right? So we still have parents that are, you know, a little frustrated that it's two thousand, three thousand, four thousand dollars for their kids to go on these trips. Mm -hmm. And you know, to the extent they really are teacher sponsored, then it's around the teacher's interest, and mm -hmm. they're interested in Spain or whatever. Fine. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that it's a little bit of a school sponsored trip, maybe we can get some teachers together to do a trip to Washington, like we used to, or a trip to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, New York City and do a service trip in New York City, something mm -hmm. like that. So, I think. You know, it's great that we offer these, but it might beho behoove us to um, promote something a little bit more affordable. Um, there's been discussions about that. And in fact, um, we've had trips to the Grand Canyon and um, mm -hmm. I think, to, well, some other, there were some other places in this country where mm -hmm. this was sponsored by a middle school teacher and actually always had something like 10 to 15 mm -hmm. students that mm -hmm. would go and a couple others. So we have do, done that. Mm -hmm. Not so much at the high school, though on those trips there were, I think, some high school students. Um, no, we don't disagree. And in fact, um, th this issue of whether you reduce the price or you add a scholarship, these are things that actually Dr. Jenger and I were talking about the other day. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have um, some money for scholarships, which, which has a process that goes through um, you know, the, our international um, coordinator. So it's a very, um, we, we want to promote students that having these opportunities. What I think all of us know from our own experience, how transformative mm -hmm. these trips are and how world yeah, your worldview changes. I think right. that that's been really true of all the students that have gone on the South Africa trip. It has been so impactful. Mm. And I, I, I agree with Mr. Hainer. I think it would be great to have some of the students come if they would be willing to do that and talk about their experience. We've had, having 47 students go to South Africa, given the cost, is huge. One of the things that, um, that I feel strongly about and, and is shared by others is that we want to create a map of trips that we know that we're going to be doing over four years. So mm -hmm. when the eighth grade parents come and when eighth grade students come, we mm -hmm. say, I want you, these are the trips that will be available during your high school years so you can plan ahead. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very helpful when students have that and they say, well, I really want to go on that music trip or I want to go on the Holocaust trip or the exchange to France or the South Africa trip. Sure that they can plan uh, and start savings for that because I think it makes more, it has more meaning for them when they participate financially in this. So actually that's one of the things we're working on developing for this year. Uh, something I recommended to Chelsea High School who were asking about trips because obviously they were saying we just can't afford South Africa. Uh, I recommended that they approach the Cummings Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, which f f focuses on this specific uh, district, uh, I mean uh, county, uh, that they offer uh, grants. They are giving away $20 million to 100 nonprofit schools are included in that number every year. Uh, so you can submit uh, grant applications to them for trips, for example, and that mm -hmm. helps reduce some of that cost. All right, thank you. Thank for you very much. Thank you. Um, so I guess we have this under the consent agenda, but I think normally we would approve it mm -hmm. as a new trip separately, mm -hmm. right? So yes. do you want to have a motion to approve? So move. Second. Any further discussion? Just a clarification. Hainer. Are we approving both or just the Puerto Rico? Just the Puerto Rico trip. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? 
Any abstentions? All right, it's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, public comment. Is there anyone here for public comment tonight? No. no. All right. So, meet the new administration. Dr. Bodhi, do you want to take it from here? Yes, well, I would like, uh, first on the list we have is actually uh, Mr. John Bowler, who is our new athletic director as of this summer. And uh, he is not someone who's new to the Arlington Public Schools, as he's been um, a very beloved and successful boys basketball coach over these years and has worked at the Boys and Girls Club. So this was an opportunity for him to talk a little bit about his experience so far and um, to have you have an opportunity to ask some, uh, some questions. Uh, hi, how's everyone doing today? Hi. Good, great. Good, um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, my name is John Bowler. I, I graduated from Arlington High in 1993, so, and I've been, you know, fortunate to coach here as well. So I think I have a perspective where I was a student athlete here and a co-chair. Um, you know, and I was fortunate enough to work for the Boys and Girls Club for 21 years, a place that I loved um, and enjoyed going to work every day. And um, this is the only place I would have left it for because uh, I, I, you know, love Arlington High School. I love the, this community. Um, and to have an opportunity to, as a basketball coach, you know, I loved working with my student athletes, but to have a, be able to have a bigger impact on the, the whole student body and all the student athletes and all the sports was, was something I just couldn't pass up. Um, you know, it's just um, it's a privilege to be the athletic director at Arlington High School, and you know, I plan to be here for a very long time. Um, you know, sh short term, you know, I've just been, you know, trying to learn as much as possible, trying to learn all my fall coaches, you know, their coaching styles, um, you know, learning, you know, you know, the school has been great, the maintenance, custodial, the administration team, students, uh, coaches, and my staff, you know, are all very helpful um, if I have questions. Uh, so it's been, you know, just learning as much as I can. Um, you know, I think each season will be a different uh, kind of animal with just the fall, the winter, and uh, spring. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping this year to just to do a full, full um, you know, um, assessment of, you know, What's been kind of what's been going on this year and the past years, and try to um, you know see what what will be best for the student athletes in the school and the community. Um, you know, I think it's uh, we have great coaches and um, they all have different styles. And you know, I've been going out to practices and games and you know watching them coach, watching them practice, and I want to bring you know you know all their coaching styles and maybe introduce them to different sports to give other coaches different styles that uh, could work for them. Um, you know, but I think. It's been, you know, a great experience so far, and, um, you know, also, also short-term, long-term is trying to figure out when we lose gym space like the Blue Gym and the, um, the pit, you know, trying to figure out where we're going to have those sports um, play uh, and go. Uh, I've been talking to the, you know, Winchester AD and Belmont because they're kind of going through similar stuff. Winchester went through a similar thing. Belmont's going through something right now, so, um, and working with a lot with Bill McCarthy about, you know, figuring out, you know, um, where we can play when different um, – gyms are taken away or field are taken away. So I think that's what I'm, you know, focused on a little, you know, long term as well, trying to figure out what's the best for our student athletes, you know, where they can play and how we can, um, you know, not disrupt them as much as we can during the, you know, the building process. Great. Questions? Mm -hmm. Ms. Seuss, go ahead. Um, so actually, not a question, but so I, one of the things I did this summer is looked over our policies. Yep. Which are, been on school committee for a while. I should have read them earlier, but they changed, and so they, anyway. <laughs> I did read them earlier, but then they changed again. So um, one of the things that was mentioned there is that yearly that the school committee will look, see a report on improvement needs of the various athletic facilities and um, conditions and needs of fields, rinks, courts, et cetera, associated amen amenities. Uh, I, I suspect that every athletics director has given that, such a report to the superintendent, but just sort of to talk about it, I think to put the bug in your ear, I think that's really helpful to come to the school committee because we handle budgets. Yep. Um, so just sort of throwing that out there. <laughs> this is sort of an end of the year type of thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so as, as you assess what you need for next year and what the next budgetary process. Yep. So. Yeah, I'll, you know, that's why you know, I'll, de I'll definitely look into that and you know, we'll, you know, as, you know, we go through each season, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll definitely um, keep track of, you know, what we need and, um, you know, what we, how to spend money on, um, you know, for our facilities. Mr. Hayner. 
Uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity. I was fortunate enough, and I'm sure the building committee's been dealing with this, to uh, look at uh, Billerica's new high school, and uh, the, the assistant principal that was taking us around was very involved in the athletic aspects of it, so we were showing off the gyms, the training rooms, and things of that nature. If you haven't had a chance, to take a look at it, he'll give you the tour for free. Oh, Mr. Brooks, Mr. Yes, Brooks, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mr. Brooks was our my JV basketball coach when I went to his school. So. Yeah, so <laughs> I, plan, I plan on like going up there because I've seen pictures of their it facility. Is, it, it, it's it is really something to see. Uh, I mean, I'm sure the building committee is working on it and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. it's well thought out, well planned, and uh, it, it, there's a lot of community involved in it. They, they have the walking track, something that we're looking at, and uh, so it's exciting. I just wanted to share that with okay. you. You've got the connection already. Yep. <laughs> so it's great. Mr. Schmidt? Yeah, I sort of second uh, Mr. Haney's remarks, and that we're really going to rely on everybody who has content area specific knowledge to lend their expertise as the building is being designed and uh, we're looking at how we're going to equip it. And I think that the athletics and uh, the phys ed are, are really uh, enough of a specialty that your expertise is going to be very valuable. Um, I just, looking at what, what's, what we're going to be going through in the next three or four years in terms of uh, demolishing this building and building a new building around this plan, and uh, I am thankful that you're looking toward that because that's going to be a bear of a job. Yep. Um, and keep us apprised of what you might need from us in terms of additional support through the process because I'm sure you're, you know, you're going to need our help. Definitely, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. I'll, yeah, I'll keep you updated on everything that's going, going on. Well, I was just going to say that Mr. Buller has been really involved. He sort of jumped into the deep end of the swimming pool this summer because we've had a number of meetings about fields and turf and so he, I just want to assure you that he's very involved in all of these discussions um, about phasing and where we're going to have to go. And it's a, it's a lot for a new, moving into a position that's as complicated and as a position and having this at the same time. I, I have to commend him for all the work he's done to help us out so far and more to come. Yep, thank you. Okay, Dr. Allison Ampey. So another um, thing to put on your to-do list, which I'm sure at this point is quite lengthy. Um, there has been interest in revisiting athletic fees and how to structure them, how to ensure fairness, equity, um, maybe decrease the, I mean, there are always parents, many parents who feel that they are too high and they are some of the highest in the Middlesex League, if not the highest. Um, and the problem, it's, it's been kind of under discussion to be looked at and has stalled the past two years for, because we've been changing um, athletic directors, but that is something that we would be interested in doing, I mean, in taking up when, when you feel ready, I know. Yeah, yeah I think um, like I'm, you know, in the next, in, in October sometime, I'm gonna meet with Michael, um, and he, he's actually outlined some different ways we can do user fees and different um, of what other schools kind of around here have done. Um, and so we're just, we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna meet with him, we're gonna look at it and see what we think, you know, the best step will be for like, you know, for Arlington to, um, to look at in the future. But like, well, def I'll definitely, um, you know, I can show you those numbers when I meet with him. Okay, great, thank you. <coughs> oh. So uh, just an additional comment on, on that. Um, so I, I think previously we had looked at it as revenue neutral um, but we, we did have the override. We have a little bit more flexibility on budget. So I think as you take a look at it, you know, keep an open mind for the possibility that there might be a slight reduction in revenue or something. We can certainly consider that in our budget process, but we need to know that sort of by January. Okay. So there is a time, time limit on that. I think the previous second, the, not the media predecessor, but the one before that, had gotten pretty far on a proposal, yep. maybe even maybe documents around with, with a proposal, to sort of collapse it into maybe two categories. Yep. Um, I think there definitely is um, you know, some sensitivity to the very high fees, but there's also sensitivity on the low end of not having you know, uh, cross-country subsidize the other sports. Right. So right. big puzzle, mm -hmm. lot, to, lot to look at, but it's certainly something we would be interested in seeing sooner if possible. Mm -hmm. 
So one thing actually that didn't happen just because of all the craziness is community outreach didn't happen. So I know that it's a issue of great anxiety to some community members and just to make sure that you sort of hear everyone's concerns and perspectives before any decisions get made or oh. before you even come to us potentially. Yep. Um, just I think people have a lot to say about this yep. issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, but um, you coached my son at the Boys and Girls Club a long time ago. Okay. So, <laughs> not a long time ago, but, but 10 years, maybe six or seven years ago. So uh, it was great. I was ex very excited to have you come over here mm -hmm. and uh, welcome to Arlington. Thank you. Thank Arlington you. I'm, I'm, welcome I'm, back to Arlington. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, you know, very excited to be here. Like, okay. like I said, like, you know, with my, when I coached basketball, I, you know, I, I could affect 45 kids, you know, during a season. Um, but, you know, being able to do more, I think, is, you know, what my family always tells me to do. And, you know, it's, it's how I grew up. And uh, I just think it's a great opportunity um, to have an impact on, you know, more, more student athletes in Arlington High School. Great. Great. Oh. I, I'm sure you know this. So you've heard this a lot. But, you know, over, since you were hired, there's been tremendous comments that I've been receiving about how thrilled the community is to have you in this position. And I hope you're able to enjoy it and serve for a long time. Thank, thank you. I hope, I hope, hope. I mean, I, this, is, this is the last job I ever want to have. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. We, we had to, Mr. Bowler has to run off to something else. So, so at any rate. I'm sure uh, there's some sports someplace. Uh, oh, <laughs> always, always, yes. Thank you. So I would like to introduce to you our new director of science, Sam Hoya, who, come on up, and maybe uh, Sarah Huber, who is our, they're a team, they have been a team quite a bit already. A whole month and a half, so we are quite well, they've a done team. a lot of work in the last month and a half uh, together. We have. She is amazing, and I'm so lucky to have her, so thank you very much for, for allowing me to have a science coach, because... <laughs> I don't know how I would do this job without her. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And Sarah comes as a high school teacher, and a little bit of middle school. And so having uh, uh, Sarah Huber with her is terrific because they really balance each other out in terms of their content, uh, knowledge, and experience. Mm -hmm. With a power so team. Power, power team. Power team. Well, you came off as a power team the other day at the elementary uh, principals meeting, too. So that was great. So um, we're here tonight to welcome you, but also to have you talk a little bit about, you know, you know yourselves and, you know, what you, where you are right now in the process of, of this work. Would you like to go first or? Sure. All right. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just elementary, elementary science coach. And I'm coming from the Needham Public Schools. So in Needham, they have um, what they call the elementary, uh, the science center, which serves curriculum and programming for K through five elementary. And so, and it was it was a great job. But I was so glad to have a job here in Arlington. That this is this is where I, I'm from, Arlington. Um, so it's just very nice to have potentially a similar position here in Arlington in the elementary system. So uh, I'm Sam Hoyo, and I come from the Rockland Public School System uh, on the South Shore. It's a very small community, but uh, it's, it was a great place to kind of learn how to be a teacher and learn how to be an educator and, and a leader. And uh, I was there for about 15 years, and I, um, I'm finishing up my dissertation, which is around gender identity and how gender uh, expansive youth experience education. And finishing that up and really kind of becoming a leader, I kind of tried to branch out a little bit. And the Arlington job came up, and I have a friend who is, is from the Arlington area, and she was like, you need to go here. Like, this would be an ideal fit for you. And I was like, I don't know. Like, no, 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 go. Mm. <laughs> I was like, All right. Um, and as soon as I met with the hiring committee, I was like, I want this job. Mm -hmm. um, I, I met you know, everybody, and I was like, I belong here. And I hadn't felt that way since I'd st I started in Rockland. So I knew that this is really where I wanted to be and, and what I wanted to do. And so I was very thankful that the stars aligned, and, and here I am. Uh, but we've really kind of been working on looking at, at the elementary level, 
looking at the curriculum that we have, which is FOSS, which is a great curriculum, but it's very in-depth. And so what we're trying to do is we are trying to create an equitable experience across all seven elementary schools. And to do that, we are working on essential standards and pulling out the essential pieces that everybody needs to cover um, so that as our you know, students go through the elementary schools, they're able to come out and go into the Gibbs with an equitable experience. So that's really kind of what we've been working on as well as common assessments. Uh, we're creating a set of common assessments, again, to help drive instruction. And our goal is that at the end of each unit, teachers will get together, they will assess themselves, they'll assess each other as a, a school, and then we will use that data to assess us as a district and kind of look to see what are we doing well, what are we not doing well, what, how can we use all of this information to help move us forward as a, mm -hmm. as a group, not as a school, but as a district. Um, so that's kind of what we've been working on there. Um, at the middle school, we're, we just implemented the iScience curriculum. Um, and so really kind of working out how does iScience fit with our new standards? Um, and how do we get everyone on board with this whole new curriculum? Because it's terrifying whenever you're, you're told as a teacher, here, you have this new stuff to do. And you're like, yeah, but I liked my old stuff. Oh, let me go back. Um, so really kind of working with each other and, and really kind of working six through eight to see where we're at, again, as a middle school, not as the Gibbs, not as the Audison, but as an entire middle school. And then the high school is, is amazing, and it's doing so many great things, and there are so many great classes, and I'm just trying to get into different types of classes with different teachers to see what it is that everyone's doing here and kind of learning um, for the high school. So it's kind of where we've been at for the last six weeks or so. Intense. Uh, like camping. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Great. So questions. Mr. Shookman. I'm, I'm glad you're thrilled to be here. I mean, the enthusiasm is just thrilling. Uh, and again, the setup is the same thing. Uh, you know, first of all, I'm really interested in hearing uh, later on how your, um, uh, your, your evaluation, your unit evaluations are going, because I like the thought of the reflective practice as being sort of the heart and soul of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that science is a pr great place for kids to do performance-based stuff and, and to really get out of the books and the paper and to embrace the, the kits and the hands-on and, and the worms and the... Uh, uh, had, oh, what was smelling up my second grade classrooms a couple of years ago? Crayfish? Uh, we had crayfish. We also had... Something else that smelled even worse. But Frogs. No, no, there's there some bug things. That, oh, silkworms. Uh -huh. Oh, the silkworms. Oh, those smell putrid. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, but it's a beautiful thing, sure. and the kids love them. Uh, but again, the other thing is, uh, I don't know uh, what Rockland's High School looked like or how you're looking at our science classrooms with the pillars in, in the middle. But again, you're... Uh, be always thinking from now through the next couple of years of, especially this year, which is heavy in the planning stage, of what you want science classrooms to look like. So I'm actually I'm coming off a building project. Ah, great. So I'm coming off a building project and onto another one. So I'm really excited about it. <laughs> I was like, you know what, where, where could I go that there's another building project? Because that was the easiest five years of my life. Let's go. So... You know, when I found out there easier. was a building project on top of everything else, I was like, no, no, this is it. This is, this is going to be my new home. You could, you could be around the demolition work, you know. <laughs> that's, that's a great science. But really, the, the fact is it's so thrilling to be able to have an influence on what the physical plant and what we have to work with is going to be going on for years and years and years. And again, I hope you're here to enjoy it for, for the long term. Me too. I'm just going to keep looking at them and... <laughs> we hire them, so yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'll keep looking at you guys then. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. Uh, being the oldest one on the committee, I was fortunate enough in the 50s when science was brought into the public schools and, and everything, and the enthusiasm of teachers 
although something new can be frightening, and I was a teacher myself, it's exciting to do things new, and you're showing this enthusiasm, both of you, and I'm excited for our students. Uh, robotics, both in the, the my two grandsons, uh, one's in the uh, fourth grade, one's in the eighth grade, they two different school systems, but they're both actively involved in it, and it's exciting, uh, the stretching and stuff. Uh, one thinks he's gonna take over the world with AI and things of that nature, but we haven't told him yet he's not, but that's okay. You never know. Is there, is there plans for that uh, at all levels? Uh, I can remember doing the uh, Lego uh, with, the, uh, right, with the, the, the turtles and stuff and the direct wiring. I don't, it, it disappeared for a while. Is it back or is it? So I'm not exactly sure. Um, I know that at the elementary level right now we're focusing solely on content, okay. but it is our goal over the next, probably not this year, because right now we're just focusing on the curriculum aspect, but our plan is to incorporate a tech piece. Uh, I don't know if that would be robotics or if it would be some sort of engineering kind of course or, or section or right. unit. Uh, but we haven't really talked about that here. And then at the high school, I think they do robotics. Mm -hmm. there, um, there's, there's, there's a club, a I think. There's a course. I thought there was a class. Um, but that, that doesn't fall under my purview as it stands right I, now. I think when the, it, for a lot of kids, when you get to do the hands-on and get an actual chance of taking the, the thinking piece and making it real, and, and it, it, it internalizes so quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All the units have some kind of, in elementary, or I'm sure across the board, have um, like an engineering design piece to each of the units. Each of the units right. will culminate in something that's, that they have to think it through, design and build. It's not, it's right. different for each unit what it is exactly. But. And I think the robotics has been um, at the elementary level an after school program in the past, right. but, but it's, right. that's an addition. Yeah. Mistress? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm, we are very excited to have you. Um, and I think the community is very excited that there's more love being given to science in terms of sort of hours, you know, FTE hours. So I think that's really exciting. Um, I have a couple of questions. One is, one of the questions I've heard about at the elementary level is that there aren't enough BOSS kits. And so that means that mm -hmm. teachers can't all teach the same thing. Um, I know they're very expensive, mm -hmm. but I don't know if there's sort of a long-term plan to maybe have enough for each classroom, or if we just think that's just too expensive and not worth it. Um, that's so, right. I'm asking that. Yeah, so, so, right, yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, this is something that we're kind of talking about, and we really kind of want to get through this year. Mm -hmm. um, we have talked about possibly taking all of the kits and having them stored in a central location, mm -hmm. and that we will say, uh, these three schools will do, first grade will do this kit at this time so that everybody can do it at the same time in those three schools and then mm -hmm. this set of schools will do this. Um, that's something we've kind of played around with. Yeah, that's um, innovative, yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking at whether or not the, you know, the essential standard pieces that we're doing right now work, then we can possibly buy more pieces of equipment just for those lessons that they'll be doing. Um, and that's going to be far more economical than buying whole kits right. if we're not using every single piece in the kit. Mm -hmm. So it's going to really depend at the end of this year what teachers decide that they want. Mm -hmm. um, some teachers, uh, I know I was at Stratton, um, and one fifth grade teacher teaches all of the life science, and so the kids mm -hmm. rotate amongst teachers. But I've been to other schools where they're like, nope, one teacher teaches all three. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to dictate to teachers how they should teach either. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be really dependent upon how, how they want to go moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, okay, good. I'm glad, I'm glad you're thinking about it. Um, the other question I have, uh, so my dad was a chemistry teacher and then an AP science <laughs> guy. Um, and he was talking, and this makes so much sense, I hadn't thought of it, that there's a movement to switch chemistry and biology. Have you, <laughs> because you know biology is so much chemistry wasn't true the way biology was taught 30 years ago. Um, I was wondering what you think about that. 
So, yeah, these are great <laughs> questions. Um, of the politics. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I'd be very careful if my bio <laughs> teachers hear me. They might come to a coup tomorrow. Um, it, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. The question then becomes the math component, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So in my last district, we did biology first. Mm -hmm. So it was biochemistry, then physics, mm -hmm. because mathematically that makes sense. Right. In an ideal world, we would teach physics first, right. and then we would teach chemistry and then biology exactly, um, because physics dictates chemistry, chemistry dictates biology. Mm -hmm. But then when you try to put in the math piece, then it becomes mm. a whole can of worms mm. because, yes, you can do physics conceptually, but to truly understand physics, right. you need to have uh, trigonometry. But right. you don't get trigonometry until you know, junior year. Mm -hmm. So um, in, in theory, yes, that would be the best way to teach science. Mm -hmm. It's probably not going to be one that we will move towards anytime soon. Got it. Um, Ideally, I, my big push is going to be to have more students take physics. Mm -hmm. um, right now, all of our kids take physical science, right. which is like this introductory physics course, very conceptual, which is great. But then, you know, this year I only have 100 kids out of the entire building taking physics, mm -hmm. and that includes honors physics and AP. And I truly believe that all kids need physics they need a higher level physics because it teaches them how to think and it teaches them how to look at a problem and really kind of go at the problem and say, okay, how do I solve this? Mm -hmm. um, I, okay, I need to write down all of my givens and I need to draw a picture and I need to understand what's happening and I need to do all of these steps. Whereas a lot of times, I, I know I'm, I'm, um, I do this all the time, I, I just want the answer. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to think through the process. But Taking physics, even though you're not going to be a physicist, will help you kind of look at a problem and say, this is how I have to go about mm -hmm. solving it. So my push is really going to be to get kids to take more physics. Mm -hmm. and, and it's hard when you have a school that's like this one that's so great that has so many course There's offerings. There's so many amazing courses in senior year, I have to exactly, say. Exactly, exactly. There are so it many awesome things really hard for kids to choose. Do. Yes. Um, yeah. And it's like... How do you tell kids, no, don't take this really awesome course because you, I want you to take this one, mm -hmm. right? So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a thought. It, the other things that, you know, Dr. Janger and I have kind of like talked about in passing about course programming and things like that that we're kind of thinking about. Good, thanks. Morgan? Um, we're a family of scientists as well, so um, I love science. I think it's <laughs> like magic, but real. <laughs> um, so uh, echoing what um, Ms. Sue said about the Foskett, sounds, I have three elementary age students. I have a couple of fifth graders, been in elementary school a long time. So much discussion about those kits. <laughs> I was on the PTO. They were always coming asking us for money for the kits, which like is weird, right? Like we got to just do better. This was obviously all under like predecessors of yours, but that's the the climate is one where I'm like all set talking about them. We need to make sure that they're you know that your idea of having them centrally located sounds great. I hope you'll also look at um, you know my kids last year in fourth grade were at Stratton. They had the experience of having three different teachers for science um, you know I, I you know I hope that as you guys talk about this this is something that you're actively engaging with teachers about I'm all for people teaching their um, subject area that they're interested in um, at the same time there's like a pretty high ramp up time for a new teacher with a new classroom and um, we do lots of responsive classroom stuff at Stratton, which is very time consuming. And I felt like it really cut into their time to actually do science because there was a big ramp up each time we changed teachers. And so there was this whole process and I felt like they did lots of like responsive classroom in science time with new teachers, but not that much science. So I hope that you guys talk about that. It maybe is working great. I don't know. They may be getting more out of it than I saw as a parent at home but I hope it's something that you know continues to be part of the conversation and then um, 
you know, I, my understanding is is that the, the the physical science happening freshman year is driven a lot by the MCAS, that they need some of that material to take their science MCAS, which is too bad because I think it, it does drive the, the sequencing a little bit, and then we, we lose them, and I... Um, I work um, in higher ed with students who are um, not typically high achieving academic students and we get them in math classes and they would really have benefited from taking physics. They didn't need AP physics in high school. They really didn't. Like they would have benefited from just physics that wasn't, and, and we can't do that in ninth grade. They don't have the math background. It's most of them, many of them haven't finished algebra one, right? By the time they're in ninth grade. So you can't have a robust physics class until you get them through some higher level math. Um, so, you know, I hope that those, it sounds like those are conversations that you guys are engaging in, and I'm really excited about that um, and thinking about those opportunities, especially for the kind of students that I see later on in their educational career who are not academically, like we are an open enrollment institution, these are not academically strong students, but they would really have benefited from having some more exposure to a little bit more robust science where they would have been required to use some of their math skills. So I think that that's really mm -hmm. exciting and I love that you guys are asking those questions. And I think moving forward, you know, um, Matt Coleman, who's the math director, and I are, are really planning on sitting down and kind of looking at our curriculums and, and trying to align them horizontally a little bit as well to see how we can help each other. Because I, I, a lot of times when I was a teacher, I saw this, that kids can look at a graph Mm -hmm. in math class and they're like yeah this is an xy graph and this is great and then you give them the same exact graph in physics and they're like i've never seen this before what is this <laughs> what is this graph thing which you talk of um and really kind of you know putting physics examples in math class or math examples in physics class and really kind of working together um you know because math and science really do go hand in hand so well and really kind of working with each other to to kind of get those skills up uh, across the board. Awesome. Oh, Two other quick things. One, when I was a math teacher, high school math teacher, uh, we aligned our curriculum specifically to support the science, so that we rearranged units and taught this early, taught and moved things back in order to align with what was going on the mm -hmm. science side, and that's really an important thing. The other thing in terms of the where, where to teach biology versus chemistry thing. Now, I, I, I struggled with biology in high school, and I adored chemistry, so I have a bias. <laughs> I do as well. <laughs> but the, the one thing is when you have a population of second language learners, uh, biology is the most difficult because it's most language intense. Correct. So that just in terms of being aware of the number of second language learners we service here in Arlington, uh, to have that in, in the back of everybody's mind as we're looking in terms of sequencing. Right, no, exactly. Um, and that's something that I think about in terms of not only our English language learners, but also in terms of our special education students who, you know, many of them with language disabilities struggle with the bio, uh, because it is, you're learning two languages simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are things that I think we can help mediate with support and, and scaffolding and, you know, just kind of working as, as teams. Mm -hmm instead of, you know, as individual islands. And maybe so. it's not one size fits all. Maybe we don't put everybody through biology first. We're well, gonna put them. Well, some, some go to chemistry first and then do biology later. You know, it, it, we, they're not necessarily linear sequential. Okay. So that uh, to lock in the whole school to do it in the same order is, if we can find a way to have that flexibility of course selections, uh, wouldn't be a bad way to think about it as well. No, I think I think that that's definitely something we can talk about. I think that that's going to be a, a cultural shift that happens to happen within the community. I think, you know, oftentimes we're locked into this idea of, well, ninth graders take physical science mm -hmm. and 10th graders take biology and 11th graders take mm -hmm. chemistry. And what do you mean you want my ninth grader to take you know, chemistry or, or, or my 10th grader to take physical science. That's a freshman class. Like, mm. so I think we have to kind of break out of that a little bit and, and <laughs> really kind of explain to the community and, and get the community involved in understanding that you're right. 
chemistry is its own year-long course. And yes, it reaches out into the others, but it can be taught as a, as a self-contained unit. Mm. Same with bio, same with physics. Um, it's not like math or English, which mm -hmm. kind of build on the skills that you learn from one to the other as much. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely do something to, to kind of think about. It, it's something that I'm thinking about in terms of um, some of our, our students who have historically struggled with MCAS mm -hmm. and, and maybe having them do biology first um, because it gives them more opportunities mm -hmm. to, to take the test and, because the retake is only offered in biology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you take physical science as a freshman and you fail, then you have to wait until the following June to take another MCAS. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take the bio one first, mm -hmm. then you could retake in February. And it just gives you more opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, something that we're kind of looking at, and, and you know, special education and I had kind of started that conversation the other day and, and talking about how do we help those students um, and then looking at the larger population and saying, how do we help the students that have historically not done as well? Mm -hmm. So, And a new building is a good opportunity to break old ways. Oh, uh, Ms. Keyes, go ahead. Hi, I just want to say our teachers are over the moon with Samantha. <laughs> they are so excited. They feel supported. Um, they feel encouraged. They feel refreshed. And I right. think... This is a great fit for Arlington. Thank you very much. So. Who is your Do friend your that we later. need to like send? <laughs> she, her friend is the one, you have a friend who like sent you here, right? Yeah. Yeah, you should leave their name and number with <laughs> We'll send them some. Gift basket. Some, yeah. some nice things. Some swag. Mr. Spiegel will uh, do the uh, recruiting gift package. We have hats, right? I, I will say, um, Dr. McNeil and I went to Rockland High School on a site visit and met with so Sam's colleagues, uh, former colleagues and students, and they could not say enough great things about her and mm. about um, what a loss she was going to be. <laughs> they were a little upset that we were taking her away from Rock. I mean, more than a little upset, but, um, <laughs> but they understood that she was, you know, had a great opportunity here and uh, were very, could, I mean, the, the way Julie just spoke about how the teachers, that's how the teachers there mm -hmm. spoke about her as well, so. Yeah. All right, my, my turn. So, mm -hmm. um, so welcome. We're, gl we're glad to have you. One of, one, of the, um, one of my concerns over the years is that when you, you know, MCAS is certainly not everything, but it's the one measure we have right now. Mm -hmm. You know, fortunately, you, you, do, you have your own assessments you're going to be piloting. But for now, all we have is MCAS. And historically, Arlington as a district has done much poorer on MCAS than it has in the other areas. In so, science. Um, in science, yeah. yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so just looking at the scores that were just released, we haven't really gotten the report on it yet, but it looks like we actually had a jump in performance this mm -hmm. year, particularly at the high school. So that's good. So we're making progress. Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to first make sure you're aware of that concern and see if, you know, if you have any ideas of, you know, why that might be, or, you know, maybe it's at, it doesn't start the elementary school. Is it, you know, any initial ideas of, of ways to tackle that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think historically looking at different districts, um, you see districts perform much higher in ELA and math than in science. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the type of test it is. In ELA and in math, they're very much skills-based, whereas in science, it's very much content-based. Mm -hmm. And so it's, you, it's very hard to be able to say, well, in math and ELA, they do better than science. Well, it's like apples and oranges. You can't compare the two. You can't compare content and, and skills. Those are two very different things. And so... Um, right. It's a, just to clarify, if you, if you rank the districts by MCAS score, Arlington would be like maybe in the 30s, 40s gotcha. in ELA and in math, but much further down in science, in the 50s or lower in science. So clearly, as a district, we're doing really well in ELA and math. In science, we weren't. I think it went up this year. I haven't seen the rankings. I, mm -hmm. think, it, I think we did go up this year. But that's just something that was out of whack. So I think that does have um, some <laughs> things to do. You know, we spend 
the majority of the day on EL, in the elementary schools mm -hmm. on ELA and on math, right? And there's very little time for science and social studies. And even when there is that time, it's often cut into for other things. Uh, and so I think that that does play a huge role. And then by the time you get to sixth grade, when they're starting to get science every day, now sixth grade teachers are playing catch up from a lot of the elementaries. Um, and we're hoping that by standardizing our, our curriculum that that will help. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and really kind of doing different types of learning as well. Um, the other initiative that we have is PBL. So trying to do some project-based learning mm -hmm. in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, um, primarily, and then moving it to the high school after that to really kind of bring that intrinsic, extrinsic um, motivation to learning, which I think will also play a huge role. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was Again. a pleasure being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a wonderful evening. So I am here today to uh, present on our MCAS scores and our performance. This will be part one of a two-part presentation. Uh, I will return on October 24th with uh, Paul uh, O'Sullivan, who is our district data specialist, and we'll delve more deeply into our subgroup results and um, compare them to how we're doing overall as an aggregate. So today's um, report. So our objectives for today's uh, presentation, we'll look at, we'll review what the next generation achievement levels are, because they did switch from the legacy MCAS. We'll, um, again, define student growth percentile, because we will be looking at some charts showing our student <coughs> growth percentile. We'll look at what's new for the 2019 accountability reporting system. There are some changes. And then we'll look at our accountability levels at the district and at into each individual school, and then we'll look across the district at our grade level performance. Um, we're not going to get into the subgroup data, as I mentioned before. We'll look at that uh, when I come back on part two on October 24th, and then I'll entertain questions and comments. So these are our next generation achievement levels. Um, we've also uh, received our parent reports, which will be going out next week. Um, and you see the different levels. There's exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. So that's what the students, those are the results as they, um, for when they take the ELA, the math. And then in some cases in the science, and we'll look at like in what areas and what grades they gave the next generation science and what grades uh, they were still taking the legacy MCAS for science. Uh, student growth percentiles, uh, so they're using this in order to show student growth from year to year, and they use, uh, they compare students who have a similar MCAS history, scoring history, and so they look at that, they look at those cohort of students, and they see how they perform from year to year, and then they give them a percentile of growth. 
And you can ask questions along the way, so if you, yes. Is there an issue using this comparison between the two different types, the next generation and the legacy? No, they, they've, uh, in s certain tests where they've given the next generation, they've found a way to uh, uh, formulate uh, an algorithm for- So that the, the, the comparison is valid? Yes. So what's new for the 2019 accountability? Um, we're looking at the various things that they use for expanded advanced coursework, which is, you'll see in the scoring reports as part of our accountability at the high school level, they use that in order to give you additional points. Uh, participation rate calculation uh, the subgroup participation rates are calculated for all subjects combined. All students rates, all students rate remains calculated separately by subject. They're using two years of data. So when I show the targeted, the criterion reference target percentages, they're from 2018 and 2019. And you're looking at the improvement that has taken place. So every year they set targets. And so you receive points in various categories for meeting those targets or not meeting those targets. And then they look at the targeted percentages and they weight them in order to come up with your 2019 accountability rating. So for 2018, <coughs> they weighted it 40% and then they weight the 2019 uh, performance 60%. And then they've added, uh, they've um, restructured the categories Last year, there were three categories. There was not meeting, partially meeting, and meeting or exceeding. And so this year, and I'll go to the next slide to show this. So based upon your target, uh, criterion reference target percentages, uh, these are the percentage bands. I should, I was, if you look at them, you'll see uh, at the bottom, if it's limited or no pro progress, you, re that's, you receive zero to 24% of the points, the per percentage of the um, target percentage. Um, and then if you look at the moderate, moderate progress, you would have scored between 25 and 49%. Substantial progress, uh, you score between 50 and 74%. And median or exceeding target percentage is 75% to 100. Any questions? And again, this is a, a weighted average between 2018 and 2019. So we're gonna get into the accountability ratings that we received as a district and each individual school. So these are our public. I wanna let our viewers know that all the results for the MCAS, they were embargoed up until a couple of weeks ago, but now they're you've probably been reading in the paper. They're now public. So um, our, you, know, you can go onto the Massachusetts or onto DESE's website and you can uh, review the results. So as we look at our uh, accountability status, you'll see it's pretty consistent across the district. At the top, you'll see Arlington as a district. We received substantial progress, and we, which is replicated in all the individual. Now, these are the non-high school high schools. So these are our elementary schools. So this is what their status is. And, and you'll see it correlates to those percentage um, points that I referred to in the previous slide. These are secondary schools, Gibbs, Addison, and Arlington. And I will say, um, without going to each individual report, because if I did, we'd be here for a while, and, and I can get into it in part two, but we did see um, per, you know, some movement, uh, some increases in our, the way that we our target percentage for 2019, and because it's weighted, some of our schools have performed a lot better than they did last year. Yes? Just a really quick question. Did they just, to do the Gibbs uh, target, did they just yank the sixth graders out of the Audison data from last year? Right, because we had, we had the sixth, we had their No, their I understand scores, that. Right. I just wanted, like, I just, so you just took, you just compared it to the last year's sixth grade. Correct at the Audison and pulled them out. And now the, is the Audison reference target 72% of 
last, well, two school years ago, just seventh and eighth graders? Or was it six, seven, and eight? It was two year, in 2017, it was six, seventh, and eighth. 2018, it was, it was six, it was six, seventh, and eighth. So you look. So this is. So and when this you is think, the 19, right? So, so, so you're looking at the spring of 2019. Yep. So you have to go back by spring. So in 2019, yep. Gibbs came online. Lat or was Understood. opened up. Right. Okay. I just. So I just wanted to make sure that the, 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 because these are reference targets that are comparing to past performance, right? Correct. So it's just it's comparing to past seventh and eighth grade. Audison students that 2019 number yes yes so 2017 would have been the first year that they introduced the next generation MCAS got it so that yep. was the benchmark so then they took so every year they compare it to the previous year and that's how you receive your points right and you they set targets so you have to either meet or exceed those targets you get points for meeting those targets as an aggregate and in each subgroup Right. I guess what I'm just saying is that this is the first year that we've seen the sixth grade pulled out. Correct. This is which the is first interesting. I mean, yeah. Right. Right. It's. I mean, it's good. I just was. I was trying to compare it to what we've seen historically gotcha. for Audison, but also right. realizing that it's a different. Right. They're at a, they're 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 they have their own school, so you want to see what the impact that that may be. I hear you. Yeah. I, I understand. Thank you. So 2019 would have been the first year that our sixth graders at Gibbs took the MCAS. And it would be the first year that we would be seeing the sixth grade MCAS scores being pulled out with this kind of data, because it used to be they were all lumped right, together at, Odyssey. at the Odyssey. Correct. Uh, oh, so I was going to ask this later, but, but what is the impetus for the weighted average? Is it, is it districts feeling like they were being unfairly evaluated going up and down, or... Sort of what? Why are we? Do, why are they doing that now? So I think that what that they're trying to do is they're trying to get everyone to really focus on, you know, decreasing the achievement gap, and so they're really focused on the the improvement. They've they've changed a lot of the scoring, so you know now it's like the lowest twenty five percentile. So a lot of that has to do. So I think overall they're trying to find a way to have us look at our. our you know our lowest 25 percent and they're trying to say we're going to we're going to set these targets and then we're going to really we're going to reward you for any type of improvement that you receive and that's why i think they put more weight on your current year's percentage because they take your current year right but we didn't have we didn't have any weighted average before right it was just a year to year so the so the difference is that it's a two year average now rather than just a one year. Isn't Correct. That, isn't that the difference? No, so, no, no, no. It's oh, it's okay. no, no, no. So okay. let me. Can you then state your question that. again? Uh, oh, so so I was assuming that we're always that in past we were always comparing it year to year. Starting in now, it seems like there's a difference that we're comparing in this two year period. Starting in 2017, mm -hmm. when they introduced the next generation MCAS, mm -hmm. they. Then they introduced in 2018 a new accountability system for oh, looking okay. at so it. They, so so they really they, so they compared yeah. your 2000 performance was your benchmark. That was your benchmark performance because that's the first year of the next generation in some in some grades from K through five. And I have to really think about this as I look at the middle school, and you'll see that. So you'll so they looked at the performance in 2017, and then you ha you received your two, your results in 2018. Right. And then they set targets for your 2018, so you receive points. Right. So you got a targeted percentage, a criterion reference targeted percentage for 2018. And then in 2019, it is a weighted average. I don't, I have to so look that's back. So that was the question is why, right. why there's a change. Uh, point of order yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> under the old accountability system, it was weighted four years. Uh, uh, okay. It was 40% for the most current, 30, 20, 10. Okay, so the idea so of weighting is not new. Uh, so the, the weighting system across years is not new because they wanted to even things out so that if you had a particularly good cohort or a bad co cohort right. going through, particularly for a smaller school, mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't have such an impact. They, they, they were looking for st the stability and consistency. However, what happened when we went off the old MCAS and we split between 
electronic testing and PARC versus legacy MCAS, everything fell apart. So they had to reconstitute the accountability system and last year was the first year of common measures that were able to be used under the new system. So that was a one year thing and it's going, as we go out for four years, it will re return to a 40-30-2010. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks. Thank you for that. And they also did this in order to, because some schools didn't have the subgroups. So before it was like you're looking, so you were actually rewarded for not having subgroups. Right. So you might have some students that didn't, you didn't have mm -hmm. like students with disabilities. So by just looking at the lowest 25 percentile, that was another reason why they changed the accountability system. Yeah. So they're now, they're saying, oh, you still have a low 25 percentile they just might not all fall into a particular subgroup. Mm -hmm. So now we're looking at across the board, the lowest 25 percentile. So they're trying to ensure that we're still focusing on that achievement gap. All right. And that's a way of like leveling Actually, it off. Actually, I know parents who are very excited by that because they felt they were being overlooked before because they didn't fit into a category. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. But it also rewarded those student, those schools that didn't have the subgroup population right. and so even though they were reporting that they were doing very well they were you still had to look at so how is your lowest 25 percent right. doing so I hope I explain that and thank you Mr. Schlipman for adding that and I just point out for the Arlington High School if you don't look at the weighted <laughs> average at 55 you went from 38% to 67%. Uh, Correct, and so that's so. where you see the marketed mm -hmm. improvement. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So, I'm sorry, I skipped a slide. So and, and the Gibbs will never have a bottom 25 because you have to be in the same school for two years in order to have that. Mm -hmm. Oh, but it's not just taking the sixth graders from No, no, the, the lower 25 calculation is a school-based population. So they're going to look at the, your, the bottom 25% in your previous year and see how they did in the subsequent year. But nobody at the Gibbs was at the Gibbs the previous year. So that, you know, un, under the oddities of the system, you won't they're have that. Right. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> they were somewhere. They were just down the road. Mm -hmm. So looking at, moving on, we're going to look at our district ELA results. And so we're going to, the way that I structured the, the charts, as you'll see, is that we're looking at them and because I felt in um, conferring with Paula O'Sullivan, our district data specialist, um, we felt that this was the best way to show the results so you can see, comp see a comparison from year to year. So if you look at the chart, you'll see that starting in 2017, because that's the first year of the next generation MCAS uh, for grade three, that you'll see that you can now compare, you can compare on the chart meeting and exceeding. So I just have on the chart here meeting and exceeding, the blue is meeting and the green is exceeding. So then you can, I, we teased out the percentage of students that were exceeding and the percentage of students that are, are meeting. And so you can compare just by looking at the chart from year to year, and also you can compare our performance in 2019 to the state. So just looking at this, and um, some of the things that jump out is that you'll see that um, in various grades, you'll see that we've kind of maintained um, from year to year, starting especially in 2000, when I look at 2018 and 2019, and then some of that has to do with like, and I try to think about and reflect upon where we were curriculum-wise. So in, in grade three um, and grade five in the last couple of years, we've you know in, introduced new units of study in the in the workshop model for reading. And so you see that you'll see a, a, a jump in grade three as you look at the performance in the 2000, 2019 as a district. You see we, there was a marketed uh, improvement. And then as you, as you look at uh, grade four, again, as we look at the professional development and the, and the focus with the coaches, you know, uh, 
you know, we probably, we, we focus more on grade three and grade five. So, you know, we have to go back and look at those various um, grades and see how we can continue to show improvement as we are, have adopted the new units of study. Any questions on this particular, yes. So the, the white part, all the way to 100, are the students who are not leaving? I'm okay. sorry, no, no, I, that is not true. Okay. I'm only putting, if you, you, you can't assume like all this over here, I'm sorry. You can't assume that that is, I'm only, I've only put up there the percentage of students that are meeting and exceeding. And then you have the other partially categories of partially and not meeting. Right. But that's, that gets you all the way to 100, presumably. Correct. And, and we'll delve more into that in the second part, which will be on October 24th. So moving to, and all these slides are, you know, as you'll see, is your ELA. So looking at 6th <coughs> through 8th grade. If you look at the comparison from year to year, you see that 6th you know, grade, there was a, a dip there. So we want to look at that. But we also want, but I want to um, also celebrate in grade 7 that where we have an increase in the number, of, in the percentage of students that are in the exceeding and on the 2019, it's passed. And then looking at grade eight, you'll see that there's another improvement in the percentage of students that are scoring in the exceeding. And then in all grades, you'll see that we have done a lot better than the state. So we continue to improve in seventh and eighth grade. We have to look at sixth grade and see, you know, where we can shore up our instruction and kind of identify those areas that we need to uh, improve upon and by looking at an item analysis of the MCAS and really hone in on what, what we need to focus on through our instruction in order to uh, show that improvement. Yes. So I know you don't necessarily, I think these slides are, are really helpful. What is really disconcerting to me is that if you go one slide back, your 100% was the far right, and then you just, if you go there, now we're at 80%. Mm -hmm. So the yes. first thing I said to mm -hmm. Mr. Cardin here was like, gosh, why do we do so well in middle school? And then I looked at, so anyway, I'm like mm -hmm. a real stickler for that kind of stuff yeah. and like representation really matters. And so I just. No, I couldn't figure out when I was like doing the slides. Cool, like totally understand. Like so I, with the Google slides and the charts, for some reason I couldn't get them all. Like if for these slides, when I tried to put in, so you can put in a range of 0% to 100%. Yeah. And when I put in 100%, it just went screwy. Okay. So I have to figure out how to make that adjustment, and I Just wasn't able to figure out for this presentation, but I will try to make sure that moving forward I'm able to figure that out and make, make them all consistent with the ranges. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, I think we do do better in middle school, but, like, I'm such a visual learner that it's, it, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a technical glitch that I couldn't figure out. So looking at grade 10, now you'll, you'll notice here in grade 10 that in 2017 and 2018, there's a difference in color um, with, and so you can see on this one, I was able to figure out the zero to 100%, and I just have no idea. I, I think that Google, we're, we're not friends right now, so. Yeah. But if you look at the, the color of the chart, you'll see that in 2017 and 2018, the results are a different color, the percentages. And that's because that was the legacy MCAS, okay? And so in grade, for grade 10, last year was the first year that 10th graders in the state 
took the ELA uh, MCAS online. So there's a difference. Um, and you'll see, the one thing that I want to point out is that if you look at the percentages and the gap between us and the state for 2017 and two, 2018, it's not that significant. But even on the more rigorous tests, which they're claiming that the next generation MCAS is, you'll see that we have increased our performance and there's more of a, a, a gap between us and the state. And that we have quite a high percentage of students scoring and they're exceeding. Now we're not where we want to be. Of course we want to continue to improve in that area. But I think switching from one, the legacy, to the next generation, we didn't see a big fall off. I mean I think it's relative to what the state did as well. But I think that is something to highlight that, hey, you know, we're still doing okay, but we want to continue to push that percentage of students who are in the meeting and exceeding to a higher percentage. So there's some work to be done there, and, I, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, claiming that right now. Yes? Oh, so, um, so I know that the test has gotten harder um, in 10th grade than it used to be. Uh, are we seeing the proportion of kids who just aren't making it go up at all? Or is it is most of the remaining gap before 100 in the partially meeting? No, we're still, so this is where, this is where they've, you know, this, this is where they, they give you an interpretive guide. Mm -hmm. So if we were to take that interpretive guide, and to answer your question, no. We, we're not we, seeing a, an increase, right, okay. An increase of you know students not meeting. You'll see that in the okay. second okay. presentation. Okay, great. So they give you an interpretive guide as how you can compare for how the students did on the next generation with the legacy. Mm -hmm. And so, we're you know if if we were to take these scores and translate them, we would probably be in the same percentile we were on the legacy because mm -hmm. they give you that opportunity to do that. But you know just looking at the way that we're performing on the next generation, again, I, you know, we're, we're still maintaining where we were. Okay. If that makes sense, because you, you know, I try to look back to say, okay, what if... So we have more students who are failing, not, right. are failing and need to then take it over again. Right. That, that's not increasing. Right. Okay, great. Right. Okay. So I'm going to go to our district math results. So again, uh, looking at grades three through five, highlighting that 2017 was the first year we had our uh, next generation, and just comparing how we did from year to year, you'll see that there has been an uptick on fourth grade and fifth grade when compared to 2018. We have more students scoring in the meeting and the exceeding, which means that we're moving in the right direction. And then again, I look at that and I look at where we focused our efforts uh, last year with fourth and fifth grade. We integrated <coughs> new units, um, or we integrated the uh, investigations, new resource in fourth and fifth grade. We had a lot of job embedded PD, and I think that that you know, uptick in the scores is showing where, that, where, the, where those efforts are paying off. Any questions? Okay. Looking at our sixth and eighth grade um, scores, again, we're we're across the board here. We're we're seeing an increase in percentage of students that are scoring in the exceeding. Uh, that was something I wanted to highlight, and that's in all grades, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Um, there was a little drop there in sixth grade, uh, but, um, you know, not an, you know, I don't, you know, looking at the, the percentage points, anything under like five percentage points, okay, we want to keep moving in the right direction and moving up, but I think one thing to celebrate is we have more st students scoring in the, <coughs> more percentage of students scoring in the exceeding, but there's a little drop off there, and I'm, and I'm, recognizing that and I know that we have to look to see why that happened and I'm acknowledging that.
but in seventh and eighth grade, we definitely increased quite a bit in the exceeding. And I want to attribute that to the fact that we have hired a brand new principal at Otteson, so there's like a stability there, the leadership was there, and so a lot of that has to do, I think, with that leadership and our, our focus on curriculum and aligning our standards, and it's starting to pay off. Looking at grade 10 math, again, you see the different colors in the chart. The teal, I don't even know what color green that is, but it's green, <laughs> a shade of green, and teal represents the legacy, and then the navy blue and the green at the bottom represent the next generation. And so again, I want to point out the fact here is as you, as you see that the distance between how we did overall when compared to the state on the next generation <coughs> is still very significant, significantly better. And so again, we're going to continue to work and do some item analysis and figure out where we need to focus our efforts to continue that improvement. Looking at our science results, and I know a comment was made earlier about our science results. So this, you know, you have to look through it to really focus on where the next generation uh, assessment was given and where the legacy was given. So in grade five, you'll see in 2017 and 2018, we gave the legacy MCAS. And then in 2019, which would have been the last year, is the first year that we gave the next generation uh, MCAS. And you'll see in, in grade five, and I think this is a result of, you know, inter in implementing and uh, uh, putting the FOSS science kits, that, that the implementation was complete. And therefore, you see that there is a, you know, I think, I think we did a very good job based upon, and it's starting to show off, like how we're, um, we're doing because there, there is an improvement and that improvement took place even though it's on a more rigorous test. So if you see in 2019, it's two percentage points, but we, it's, it's not as if we dropped off. You know, we, we continue to maintain and I think has a lot to do with our alignment with the standards and the introduction of the false science kits. So, you know, just so everybody knows, they only give the science uh, assessment in fifth and eighth and tenth grade. So we're looking at the uh, eighth grade results. And I'm very proud of how we've done at eighth gr in eighth grade because we see a huge improvement, even though they changed the test of the number of the percentage of students that are scoring in the exceeding category. And then again in tenth grade, they gave the legacy test, and we pretty much maintain our performance in that on um, 2019 when compared to previous years. So we're going to get into the student growth percentiles. I think I want to give the ranges. So the ranges of the growth percentiles is that you want to be uh, 60% or higher, so these are given in percentiles. So as we look at this quadrant, you want to be in the upper right side, which has high achievement and high growth. The black dot in the middle is the state, and then the colors represent where each one of the grade levels falls on this, on this particular quadrant. So we want to continue to move to the upper right side, which would mean high high achievement and high growth. And if you, you know, the way that the scores are listed on the right hand side, we are moderate to high growth across the board. We want to continue to push that because that means that even though students may be scoring in a certain category, they're showing growth mm -hmm. and we want to keep moving in the, in that, keep pushing that forward. Again, looking at, we're looking at, um, and so that, I'm sorry, that was ELA, grades three through eight. This is math, grades three through eight. Again, we're looking at the quadrant. The state is the black dot in the middle. 
And as you see in grades three through eight in math, you want to see, we want to see, you know, the, the scores are pretty much on the right hand side and moving in the right direction where you have that high achievement and high growth. And if you look to the right, you know, fifth grade is, that would be considered high growth. Eighth grade is 62%, that's high growth. And so we're moderate to high growth. And we want to conti continue to push that. Grade 10, you're only going to see one dot. Um, so this is ELA. We have moderate growth there. The state is the black dot. And again, we're going to continue to move that to the right of the black dot and up to the right on the quadrant. This is math, grade 10 math. And keeping in mind that this is also the next generation in ELA and math for grade 10. Questions or comments? Yes. Do you, uh, do you gather data on a specific cohort to follow them through the years? Yes. And to, to see if it's consistent? Or, in other words, if they consistently score in those areas or showing growth and things of that nature? Yes, they, they do. On the Edwin's analytics where you, you know, you're able to get your MCAS reports, you can follow a cohort, a, a grade level cohort from Thank one grade to the next. Dr. Osnappi? Um, what's Project Lead the Way? So Project Lead the Way is, is similar to like project-based learning where it's a form of instruction that you implement within your district or your school and it, it focuses on application um, like internships and really taking what the students learn in the classroom and giving them opportunities to apply it in a certain area. It's very similar to project-based learning, but it's like a, it's like a methodology of instruction. Um, and then um, you had mentioned on a few of these that you wanted to go back and look at why you, know, why you got the results you did and what needs to happen with the, what mm -hmm. changes need to happen with the curriculum or, or how to enable better student growth in the coming years. And I'm just hoping if, once you have some of these results, if you could come back and share them with us, because that's something that's always a little frustrating to me is that we see these results, but we never see where, what's happening because of the result. You know, what, What's, what are the steps being taken next and how does, how they relate to what we found on the MCAS? I'm not asking to see everyone's scores and stuff, but just like, you know, we looked at it and we found out that people were missing this chunk of science or something. And so, you know, next year they're going to do that part longer or they're adding it in or something like that. You know, I, you know, uh, thank you for bringing that. What I can do is I can maybe hit on that on part two of the uh, presentation. Yeah, that'd be great. Because it wouldn't be that hard to do that. Uh, let me just tell you some of the ways that we do that. You know, grade level teams, and I think that this year we were able to, you know, change the elementary schedule and give that time to principals and grade level teams to meet together to review data, look at student work. And so the MCASs would be one assessment that they're already discussing in those, they call them ACE blocks now, and that they're looking at where um, in the curriculum, in the standards, where we did <coughs> a great job, you know, celebrate our growth, and then where are the areas we need to focus on. And you can easily do that by doing an item analysis. Mm -hmm. And the MCAS, uh, what they do is they release some questions, some questions they don't release, but they, you can also pull reports where you can see the percentage of students and how we did in each one of the standards. Mm -hmm. And then we break it down even more by looking at the various questions that were actually asked connected to that standard. Mm -hmm. Some of the questions they release, some they don't. But it definitely, you can break it down by subgroup population as an aggregate, aggregate to see where students did well on a particular standard and where we need to say, hey, 
you know, we really need to focus on this area in our instruction. So it wouldn't be that hard to do, and I can come back with that information in part two and say, this is what we found out for this particular subgroup or looking at the aggregate and say, okay, this is what we found out by that, doing that item analysis and that's looking at the standards. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, great. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, diversity hiring report. So yeah, we're still on public comment. I'll try to go quickly. Uh, oh, no, that was, uh, that was <laughs> not directed at you. That was directed at you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, some slides that I saw last week at our um, the MASPA, the Mass Association of School Personnel Administrators meeting. It was presented by Shay Edmond from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education on some initiatives that they're doing. I'm not going to go over this whole slideshow. It's in the in Novus, but there are a couple of slides I thought were interesting um, that am I doing this? You know those batteries go it is, it go works. bad quickly, I've noticed. When I used to use them. Yeah. Oops, there we go. Um, so a couple of things I just some they did some MCAS stuff, but Student enrollment in Massachusetts by race and ethnicity. Massachusetts is about overall in the whole state about 60% white student population, about uh, I think 20, a little over 20% Hispanic, a little under 10% African American, and a little bit under that in Asia. If you look at the teachers, educator and teachers, they have a, the top. Uh, bar is all Massachusetts educators, and the bar beneath that is just teachers. Um, and if you look at that, there, you know, 92% of the teachers in Massachusetts are white. Um, and compared to the students, um, you know, when only 60% of the students in Massachusetts are white, um, there's a big disparity. Only about 3% of Massachusetts teachers are black or African American and a smaller, only 2% Asian, and um, I think the, uh, the number of Hispanic is about 3% as well. So in the whole state, we have a huge disparity in terms of the number of students that we're, we're serving versus the educators who are teaching them. Now I wanna go back to our... Okay. Oh, presentation. Yeah, so... So I just wanted to just put that in a little bit of context of what the whole, you know, uh, every district in the state is uh, is attempting to increase the diversity of um, of the staff. In Arlington, our student population we're about seventy percent white, thirteen percent Asian, three point four four percent Black or African American, six point. One one percent Hispanic Latino and um, about six point eight two percent multiracial. Our employee numbers, uh, similarly, we're predominantly white employees with smaller percentages of um, African Americans, Hispanics, and and Asians than our student population. Similar in some ways to the population of the state uh, teacher and educator employee numbers. Um, our new hires since, uh, so the, the new hires are from October 1st, 2018 through September 30th, 2019, with the bulk of those new employees coming over the summer into the, for the beginning of this school year. Um, one of the issues we have is there's a, the N is a new employees who do not identify. We didn't get the, um, you know, on the, 
the sheet that they fill out, they chose not to fill that section out. So there's a, a you know, 11, almost 12 percent who didn't identify. Of those who did, um, well, again, of the, of the new hires, 74 percent are white, 4.41 um, percent Asian, 4.9 percent black, 3.4 per three percent Hispanic, and uh, Native American or Indian is a small percentage of 1.4 percent. AEA employees are all the uh, of these teachers in the uh, AEA Unit A bargaining unit. Um, of the teachers there, I think it, it's closely aligned with what the state has in terms of predominantly white teaching or <coughs> similar to the state, almost of a 91 percent. Um, small percentage of, um, you know, 2.5 percent Asian, 1.25 percent black or African American, 1.61 percent Hispanic, and then a number who don't identify. For new hires in the AEA since last year, um, I think 77 new hires, 70 are white, three Asian, two black, one Hispanic, um, <coughs> one not identified. Um, paraprofessionals, a little bit um, higher percentage of uh, paraprofessionals <coughs> from diverse backgrounds. Um, as you can see, um, we've we have a little bit more. The percentages overall um, have increased in some areas and, and decreased in others, but again, predominantly white. And the, the other thing that has kind of increased is the non-identified, and I have to look at why that is if we were categorizing people differently in years past, because that doesn't, the, that number doesn't make that much sense, so I have to go back and look at that. Um, AAA, administration, principal, central office, IT and administrative assistance, um, those numbers have, um, you know, 84, per, almost 85 percent black, uh, white, 3.6 um, percent Asian, 6.12 percent black, 2.4 percent Hispanic, and uh, about 4 percent non-identified. Arlington after school program, um, that is actually one area where um, our after school administration has had more success probably than any other group in the district in attracting and hiring a diverse staff and hiring more staff of color to teach in the after school programs at Hardy, Thompson, Pierce, um, Gibbs, and, and the bracket um, Spanish immersion program. So you can see those numbers um, are definitely better in terms of more, um, in some areas, more closely um, aligning with the student population. Maintenance, transportation, and food service, similarly, a little bit more diverse than the, um, the staff as a whole in the district. And the comparison between students and staff ethnicity sort of side by side, it's pretty clear that uh, like the state, um, like most districts in the state, we have a predominantly white staff serving a, a, a more a growingly diverse student body. And our goal, always is to increase the diversity of the staff to more mirror um, the student body. Um, and I think some of the things that we do, that we've continued to do, is um, participate in mass partnership for diversity in education, attend targeted job fairs, really try to um, um, encourage, um, strongly encourage our administrators to reach uh, diverse audiences when they're recruiting and to um, there are filters we can use in um, in school spring and other um, job boards to um, to attract a more diverse um, diverse teaching force I think in the teaching um, people who are licensed educators in Massachusetts there are um, I the state if you look at the other presentation that I put in the state does have some some programs that they've launched in the past couple of years to try to increase the diversity of teachers, specifically teachers in Massachusetts. They have some, some grants, some things that we, unfortunately, at this point don't qualify for. The, a lot of those targeted um, grants and, and programs are targeted toward um, districts that are more high needs than we are, and are there some of those um, those programs are limited um, to other districts that we would not qualify for. Um, 
So we are, um, you know, we're continuing to, the, to do all of those things. The Mass Partnership for Diversity in Education has seen increased interest by other districts who want to join. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of, because a lot of districts are seeking to increase the diversity of their staff, they're looking for ways to do that. They think um, that, you know, and it, it does help to join with other districts that have similar goals to share ideas, to, to share best practices, and that's, you know, something we do. I think in all of our, um, with the superintendent, assistant superintendent, special ed director, all of our, um, our job-alike groups in the state, this is an issue that we all are thinking of. So, and I think the principals too. Uh, Mr. Hainer? Uh, the universities in teacher preparation, do they reflect the stats that you're showing, high, high percentage of white? They do, yeah. I mean, there was one slide in the other uh, presentation from the state that I think it's 86% white um, enrollment in educator prep programs so in the state. Part, Just part, better. Of, part of the problem, <laughs> part of the problem is, is, is the pool itself in, on the state level isn't being prepared. There are multiple challenges, yeah. The, the pool itself, people um, it, <coughs> who are people from, you know, educators of color, people, who, people of color wanting to go into education as a career, and I think that's similar in other professions as well. Um, but, um, right, attracting um, people of color into st educator prep programs and, and then continuing through those programs and becoming licensed educators. Being a little bit mercenary, it's a seller's market. Uh, it sure is. So we are at a slight disadvantage with regard to teacher salaries in the area. We are. Okay. I just wanted to make that, that clear. He, even if the pool was there, we'd still be an uphill struggle with us. We are to competing districts. against um, Boston, Cambridge, Lexington, mm -hmm. right. um, our town manager 12 communities, and do, our do, surrounding communities. Do any of those communities have a substantial difference in diverse staff than we do? Well, I think... Um, because of that factor that well, I just I think mentioned. There are certain communities like Boston and Cambridge that have different, um, I think still, I think Boston, and someone may be able to correct me if I'm wrong, I think Boston might still be under um, an affirmative action decree from years ago, um, and some other s communities are as well. But um, the, the, the financial aspect, uh, I, mean, I guess my question is, aside from Boston and required by court order and things of that nature, the difference in salaries and stuff, are any of them have a significant increase in diverse staff, or is it still just the issue of the pool itself? I think the districts that, uh, that have higher salaries are probably able to, uh, to, um, to attract okay. more diverse staff, more staff in general, but I mean, that's, that's one factor. I mean, right. Dr. McNeil had something to add. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a focus of my dissertation for my doctorate, and we also have to realize that, you know, Arlington is a majority white district, and as you look at those districts that you just named, like Cambridge and Boston, you might have individuals that want to go back to the communities for which from mm -hmm. from where they were they come from, and they were educated, and they want to give back to the community, and because they have a higher percentage of students of color. Mm -hmm. African American students that that might also, you know, be a factor mm -hmm. of trying to recruit uh, staff of color to come to a majority white district. So I don't know if, whether or not you can because when you look at pay and research, pay is not a very high on the indicator list of that's going to attract people to a particular district, especially in teaching. Mm -hmm. So it, because of the nature of the job and the way that people feel like they can give back to their community. We're also competing with those districts that have a majority, um, a higher percentage of students of color, and so they're going to want to go back to those communities. And we, we, especially even if they're not from a, from those communities, when you look at staff of color, when you speak to them, they want to go to those communities where you have a higher percentage of color. I think that color. is a major mm -hmm. contributing mm -hmm. factor. But I also think, and it, I'm not suggesting we attempt to compete, but schools like Lexington. Uh, there is that additional factor when, when the salaries are increased by a, a higher percentage. I agree with you. I think giving back to the community, that's one of the things educators, you have a good education, you want to give back a little bit more, you want to share with your guy. I think that's a primary focus. But if there's a toss between two communities, 
uh, on that basis is a degree of mercenary and, and, and you're looking at families and growing and things of that mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been an issue that we have in this community. It's going to continue to be an issue in this community. It's not going to be solved in one night. Like and I also want to highlight the efforts that uh, Mr. Spiegel has Absolutely. done in order to, mm -hmm. you know, create uh, opportunities for people of color to come and just explore the opportunity of working in Arlington. If you look at our diversity coffee that we had last year, it was very well attended, and that's because he's gone out to various job fairs um, at different universities in order to, you know, just speak with people and 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 you know share you know, various uh, qualities of Arlington and, and, and invited them to the diversity coffee. So we had, a, we, have a, we had a very nice turnout for our diversity coffee, and then we have to match those positions with our vacancies. So it's a very complex problem, and uh, it's gonna take some time for us to resolve it. And I, I do think there are also some, you know, if selling education as a prof selling the profession to people in general as, you know, place they, a, a career they want to uh, to explore and go into um, is something that I think our teachers our, our administrators are every, everyone sort of has a, a hand in and um, yeah Ms. Seuss? Uh yeah so I I, I want to thank everyone for their efforts because I do mm -hmm. think that we do take this seriously um, I would love to see the numbers of ident unidentified go down. I, I was going to yeah, ask that, and I know that you, your answer is you're not sure yet why why those numbers are so high. Um, uh, I want to encourage people in the community. Uh, we just heard the story of our new science uh, director say that she, um, got the uh, the notice of the position because of a personal connection, mm -hmm. and I think personal connections can be very powerful. So I want to encourage mm -hmm. people in the community if they know people to sort of talk of Arlington. <laughs> Um, you know, of diverse factors because because personal connection, um, you know, as you point out, that pay is not necessarily the only motivation. Sort of showing that Arlington is a welcoming community can be really important. Um, and I just want to encourage people to sort of help spread the word. Um, I just want to also make a comment. It seems like one place that we could all sort of maybe focus our attention on, and maybe there have been efforts, is on the power of professionals, which mm -hmm. are of a yes. more diverse background, um, and that who may not see themselves necessarily as teachers, but are obviously interested in students and you know, in, in the educational system and, and might be able to be sort of mentored in that direction. Um, and, and I think as I highlighted in my, the last presentation, just on the new hire presentation, that we always hire paraprofessionals, teaching assistants, who have been teaching assistants to become licensed educators are hired in classroom positions usually at the elementary level, but sometimes in other levels as well, and that happens every year. Mm -hmm. And so, right, attracting uh, more um, diverse uh, uh, people into the paraprofessional ranks will lead to more teachers. Right, and then just also um, any sort of mentorship that we can give yeah. um, people who may not know what the path is, you know, it's helpful. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Hamby. Um I read through the DESE presentation that you gave. I thought it was very interesting. Um, one thing right after their slide where they talk about the mass educator preparation program demographics, um, they talk about barriers to recruiting teachers of color and um, the three things they have listed are obstacles to completing college, impact of student debt, debt on teacher preparation, enrollment and completion, and teacher licensure exams. but I was wondering, looking at the demographics, I'm not sure I feel like the barriers they show match the demographics that are there. And I just, did they talk about, I mean, I don't know if that's a reasonable assessment or not, but it feels like there's something else going on. Um, yeah, I mean, they definitely, we talked about the the M uh, the M tells as mm -hmm. a barrier mm -hmm. uh, for 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 some people and and um, and there is a cost to take the M tells and if you don't pass the M tells you have to pay to take them again so that is that can be a barrier um, uh, that, I mean that that is one thing that's something that comes up frequently in meetings I attend of different groups um, mm -hmm. that, that, that that's an issue um, yeah. it just seems like the 
feels like the barriers before they get into college because they're not. Right. So. If, if I may, when I went to college, there was a lot of state schools, undergraduate, you got a degree in elementary or secondary sci uh, secondary, and you got to teach high school and, and the certification was lifetime. Now you have to, you're expected to get a master's degree within five years or with some extensions. You have to pass the MTELs and you have to continually every five years take more courses and things of that nature. So there's a financial issue. The state schools are not as abundant as they used to be. I mean, they were, they were, they specialize in all the different areas of education. So there is a fine, there are private schools now. You go to Leslie, that would cost you a fortune. Uh, BU and the other schools around, BC and things of that nature. So it, I think to get a degree in education and to stay in education, there is a financial cost. There is. Even if you're successful on the MTELs. It's and a, there are some areas, if you want to teach special education, you have to take a lot of MTELs, yep. mm -hmm. do a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of coursework that you have to take to get that license. That, I mean, and I will say that special education is one area where it's hard to find um, a, a, as much of a diverse applicant pool. And with success in that area, you're a high commodity to go to other states <laughs> and, and where it's cheaper to live as well and make a better salary. So I, I don't mean to be mercenary, but does it, once you succeed in this state, and get certification, you, you, you're, you've got a high product to sell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tough. Okay. All right, anybody else? Good job, thank you. Oh, Mr. Suckman. Yeah, I think one of the things we have to think about in terms of recruiting teachers, no matter where we are, is that the experience that somebody has in the school system as a student is often the influence of whether they want to come back and feel welcome. Good point. And so that if minority students who attend a system do not feel welcome or happy, yep. they will not come back to work for you. So that the, the marker is how many of the folks who are going through your system are coming back looking to work for you? All right, anybody else? Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. <laughs> and next, uh, Ms. Seuss, we have the Arlington Human Rights Commission documents. Uh, yeah, so I want to take these up separately because there's different um, issues that I know members of the committee feel about the two, two things, but I just want to give you the history of these two documents. Um, the guidelines for responding to hate incidents was brought to us both of these were brought to us two years ago <laughs> um, by, by the Arlington Human Rights Committee. At that point, they had met with the chief, then chief of police. Um, they had come up with, with this, and they were presenting it to us for our consideration. Um, we, at that time, had some concerns, which we gave back to them. And through because of internal things going on with that committee and other things, it sort of got, died for a while. Um, so that is, um, uh, we then this summer had a meeting to discuss this issue um, with um, the superintendent in our superintendent's office. I attended that meeting. Um, there were teachers, administrators, there was police pre um, officers, and there was human rights committee members mm -hmm. um, where we did a lot of wordsmithing um, and came up with something that everyone felt good about, then brought it to the Community Relations Committee, and there were some more words with thing going on. Um, I sent that back to the Human Rights Committee. <laughs> they said that was fine, um, and now it's being brought back to us. Now, um, maybe Mr. Hainer would like to speak to um, this issue. The one question is, um, what is the status of this document, um, and whether it's, it's just sort of a... Um, you know, a, a document between the Human Rights Committee and the superintendent or whether it should be an official school committee document. Now, let me just give you the background of the other thing and then I think we should talk these things separately. So the other document is the school liaison document. Um, that came about also about two years ago um, out of conversations that Sharon Grossman and I had um, that it, there was just a lot of frustration on both sides about what exactly the relationship was between the Arlington Human Rights Committee and the schools. 
and the Arlington Human Rights Committee used to have a really great relationship 15 years ago, and somehow it deteriorated, and the, and the idea was let's try to come up with some language that would codify that relationship between the, um, uh, who the uh, liaisons are and sort of, so that when a liaison goes to a principal, the principal doesn't feel sort of put off by that, and, and everyone sort of feels comfortable with it. So um, we worked on that for a while. The agreement was that there wouldn't be a liaison at each school, that it would be sort of a one or two people who really know the district, um, know the research, know the um, resources in, in the community and, and, and in the state, um, who could then be a, um, both a, a resource for parents, but also potentially a resource for administrators if they so asked. Brought that to the Human Rights, to the Community Relations Committee, and that, uh, w and had some suggestions, sent it back to the Human Rights Committee. <laughs> they said yes to those suggestions, and now it's back to us. Um, and, and this is potentially a, uh, a document that we might have a different feeling about because it doesn't directly involve um, sort of a, um, a conversation about, about how we want the superintendent or the administration to behave, right? So, so we might, as a committee, feel differently about that document than the first document. So giving all that background, I think we should take up each in turn and people should express their thoughts. Okay, so let's let's start with the, the uh, guidelines. Is that okay? Mr. Hainer? Um, uh, with the guidelines, I think if, if we adopt, and I'm not saying we do, if we adopt these guidelines, I think there are at least two areas that I have deep concern uh, on what to do on the line, notify the principal, I would add uh, the superintendent and the principal. <laughs> I think that's very important because, and then going further down in the document, um, down on follow-up, uh, that that piece right there, uh, replace the word principal uh, wherever it shows up in this paragraph with the word superintendent. Because I think it's very important that the superintendent not only be notified, but the superintendent has historically been the spokesperson for the district and so that we speak with one voice mm -hmm. and uh, not have separate interpretations. Not to say the principals would do that, but principals are concerned with their own particular school. Okay, so uh, could, I, could I, I, could I, yeah, yeah, I okay. just want to finish. I'm not saying, I, I, I see, I'm not opposed to this. The other part is all these areas have always belonged to the school district. I have no problem the, uh, the uh, Rights Commission being involved in stuff, but um, and, the, and I appreciate all the changes that you, you've made. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they were very encompass, encompassing. But I, I personally think the superintendent is the first and last word on communications to the community uh, as the district. Ms. Seuss? Oh, so um, I think, I, th I thought you were going to speak to the issue that you raised in the our subcommittee meeting because there is a question about what the status of this document is. So if it's a school committee document, then we should be working on, right, but if it's not a school committee document, then, you know, the group of 20 people, what? We just do this. Well, then the 20 people who are in the meeting, including the police officers and stuff, who worked on all this language, and I don't think the language is perfect, it's just, uh, who do you go back to, but right? They, so, so do we gather that twenty people, those twenty people, back in the room together, or do we say, you know, human rights committee? So, if it's a if it's a school committee document, then we should be involved in wordsmithing it. But if it's not, then we either say we like it or we don't. Yeah, I agree. Yes, Mr. Trainer. I do not. As long I have no problem it going back to them, but I don't think anyone but the superintendent can should even talk to principals and get information from principals and directing principals what to do. That, and that's why I suggested initially this belongs to the school committee as a, as a document. Uh, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, I'm confused who this document is speaking to. I mean, it sounds like there's also confusion who it's coming from. Yes. But who is it speaking to? Is the audience the staff, the, the school staff? Is it parents? Is it both? Mm. Is it the community at large with a school-related incident? You know, I, I don't understand who the audience is. 
and that makes a difference in how I view it. Then I also, when I read it, and, and I understand this is wordsmithing stuff, but I think it's trying to be a, this is what you do list, but it has some things in depth, it has other things that aren't mentioned at all except at the top, and it has, it, it, it's kind of all over there. It, it either needs to be a, this is what you do, or a top level, these are the kind of things you, you need to do, and then referring to something else that's a, this is what you do in detail. Or, or I mean, that's one way of doing it, but it's, confusing to me for several reasons. Okay, this is? Um, so, so generally, I mean, the, I don't think it's written perfectly, but you know, you get a committee of 20 people and various, and two years of process, <laughs> it ends up being messy in the end. But, um, but basically, I'll tell you what the history of it is. The history was that there was an incident several years ago that was not, um, that was covered up, if you remember, and that alarmed both the police department and the human rights committee, and they said, let's work together on this document. And th that, that's what happened. And they said, let's come up with a protocol that would be shared with it, that, that with the superintendent's permission would be shared with all administrators. So the idea is this is supposed to be a document that every time we have a new administrator, you say, this is our protocol, this is what happens. Um, whether we're gonna radically change it has to do with what the status of it is. And so I think we should talk about do we, I mean, the, you know, okay, that's great, the Arlington Human Rights Committee and the police department got together and they talked and, and other people got involved, <laughs> but we don't care because this kind of document should be ours and we're gonna write it the way we want. Or do we say, no, it's not our document, it's something we can say, yes, you know, oh, it sounds great, but it's not our document. And so I think that's really the question here. Okay, so I guess my feedback is, I'm not speaking to the it's ours or not, my feedback is, as a protocol, I don't think this works because it's, you're, you're asking for something that you can just hand the new principal and say, here, if something happens, this is what you do, but it says identify the incident and it has nothing about what you mean by identification or anything. Preserve the evidence, same thing. It, it's like, it doesn't talk about that, but then it has notified the principal and then document, and then down below it has document and it has more stuff. It, it's just, it's kind of, it, it's not just. <laughs> I, I didn't create it. I yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, um, I'm just saying it, it's, so, okay. Um, <laughs> yes. So, yeah, so, so I, Dr. Bode, I, I was gonna say, I, I think we need to hear from Dr. Bode, because my understanding is that you have reviewed this and you yes. are okay with it. With the <laughs> so is this a document you would be comfortable giving to principals? The principals have seen this, and they've given their blessing to it. it I, I don't think that, I think that um, Dr. Seuss is correct. When you have a group of people trying to wordsmith, that it's not coming out perfectly. But the intent of this is that there is this communication with the principal, uh, the principal with the superintendent um, right away, as well as the people in that school. There is also communication with the police department, which is done through mm -hmm. our SRO. Um, doesn't mean that the chief and I don't talk, mm -hmm. we do. And as well as having um, um, the Human Rights Commission. So we actually unfortunately had this in practice this last week. I think the incident you're referring to is that something that I didn't even know about. It was a while ago. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean it, was, it happened a, n a number of years ago and I don't think mm -hmm. that um, that was a, I think that was a one-off situation. That's not how it really operates. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, I am pretty much the very first person that the, the principal will call as we d um, assess the situation. And uh, that's what happened this time. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in my superintendent's report. But, but everyone has seen this and you, People would argue with it's not perhaps as well worded or as <coughs> perhaps as, you know, do this, 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 and this, but it captures the intent of how we want to operate. Mr. Chagrin? Okay. Um, if this is ours, it becomes a policy. Mm -hmm. 
and it should be written as a policy and given as a directive to the superintendent in the district that these are our expectations. If this is something that the superintendent wishes to instruct her principals as to what to do, what her expectations are in the event of an instance, we can look at this and say, okay, fine, uh, Superintendent Bodie, hand us the principals, this looks good to us. Uh, and we, even without a vote, uh, you know, sort of one of these without objections, thank you for bringing this before us, this looks like a reasonable process for you to direct your principals to do. I view this in the latter category as something the superintendent is comfortable with this and the principals are comfortable re receiving this direction and the Human Rights Commission is comfortable interacting with us in this manner. Uh, it's a beautiful thing and we should just sit back and, and uh, let it happen. Ms. Morgan? So um, I, I think it's interesting that the the beginning of this was mm -hmm. a, an incident that that didn't mm -hmm. get brought forward, which I also am not privy to, which is fine. Um, I think back to last year when there was an incident at Stratton that was not necessarily a hate incident, right? There was mm -hmm. graffiti that was violent that was not reported initially. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, I, I know that these kind of things, it's very hard to parse, right? Mm -hmm. So what is hate, right? Is saying you want to kill mm -hmm. somebody hate? Well, no, because it's not directed to an individual or a group of people based on these, mm -hmm. you know, 12 to 14 mm -hmm. characteristics. So presumably, under that scenario, this documentation wouldn't be necessarily followed. Right. So, but I do. I, I. What I. What I get concerned about is, is that we we have very specific, sort of. There are like check boxes on this document, as if like I could take my pen and be like, okay, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Um, when I see that with something like this, and then I think about all of the other like nuances that aren't going to fit into this, then I start to get to be uncomfortable. I agree with Mr. Schlickman. If this is what superintendent would like to have and and hand out with check marks or not you know I, I i feel comfortable with how you handle these things mm -hmm. so i um have not been concerned historically nor am i concerned now so if you want a piece of paper with boxes on it or if you don't or you know i'm not like i'm i'm saying that sort of tongue-in-cheek right mm -hmm. but it, i'm kind of like I, I don't have a strong feeling about it. Mm -hmm. I do think I would have a hard time sort of codifying this mm -hmm. in any kind mm -hmm. of official capacity. Uh, anybody else? First time? Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm with Paul. I, don't, I think this is a protocol that the, or a mm -hmm. procedure the superintendent has developed, and she's comfortable with it. And so I don't think there's anything the school committee to do here. I don't. <clears throat> uh, so, yes, I, I'm going to agree with my colleagues. I think uh, if the Human Rights Commission is looking for a specific policy, then it needs to be much more narrowly tailored. Yeah. And um, I think uh, I think this has been through the ringer for a couple of years. Um, uh, it you know it in the absence of the of the HR of the Human Rights Commission asking for this, would we have developed this exact document? Certainly not. Right. But it was something that we were responding to them, right. working with another organization in town. The superintendent was receptive to that. Mm -hmm. Jennifer played middleman quite a bit mm -hmm. um, to help move it along, and you know it's it's it 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 covers I think sort of the basic requirements that I'm comfortable with, um, and and again it's not something that I think we should develop as a policy, Mr. Hainer. Uh, policy file ACH-R procedures for addressing complaints, discrimination, or harassment based upon protected classifications or retaliated re related retaliation. One, where to file a complaint. Two, content of complaint, whole procedure with your checklist. Investigation is part three. Four, resolution of the complaint. Five, timelines follow up. Six, appeals with all the things. This is our current mm -hmm. revised policy listing all uh, federal state statutes and regulations. Again, for, if you want it, it's ACH-R. So it's already been codified. codified. So I think the consensus is that we're not going to take action on that yeah. policy, okay. and you can communicate to the Human Rights Commission that you've agreed with it, and we'll distribute mm -hmm. it to your mm -hmm. principals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm.
moving on to the next one, the liaisons, is there sentiment about or, or suggestion about what to do with that one? Yeah, so I, I just wanted to make, point out that, that <coughs> guidelines, I think, does, you know, just to sort of mm -hmm. the word guidelines does, I think, suggest a looser interpretation mm -hmm. of that policy. But um, yeah, so that, um, when we met in subcommittee, there was uh, less concern about making that a school committee policy, So, I, but I, we did want to bring it to the full committee to see if there was any thoughts. Um, that felt like a sort of an agreement between the Human Rights Committee and the superintendent and <coughs> the administrative team about mm -hmm. what felt comfortable to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, but we did want to bring it to you to see if there's any um, questions or concerns or, or thoughts about its status. So who are the liaisons? They're not on the Human Rights Commission, but there are other people? They are in the Human Rights Commission. So one of actually, one of the historical, so there was this great relationship 15 years ago and that sort of fell apart. One of the um, concerns was that um, I think administrators weren't comfortable having a, um, a parent at each school sort of coming in and mm -hmm. inserting themselves in a way that felt inappropriate. Um, and... Um, so the idea that if you have only one or two who really does have expertise in the kind of resources that are around and, um, and, and then also can be a point person for the reason that you, this liaison role is really important is um, to sort of maybe diffuse tension. Parents who feel that, that something isn't being resolved or, or aren't sure what to do can talk to that liaison and that liaison can then maybe help that, that parent um, explain what has happened navigate the system, you know, communicate with the principal. Um, parents weren't always feeling like things were being resolved, but they may not have known what, what had happened, actually. So, mm -hmm. so that was sort of the feeling that this person could, one or two, and it was, it, the idea is that it's going to be one or two people, and they hadn't decided, either one person for the entire district or one person for elementary and one person for secondary, mm -hmm. um, could sort of play that role. Mr. Hainer? Clarification, are they representing this, are they the liaison between us? Nope. Are they, the, then why are we involved in it then? If they are the liaison only, of the Human Rights Commission. Oh, only because actually um, Sharon Grossman and I helped develop this and we brought it to community relations. Oh, okay, ago. I understand <laughs> that and I appreciate that. I, I just want to be very clear that they're not representing the school committee. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and they'll have no authority with the principals whatsoever. It's a communication. Right. Thank they, you. they have the authority that the town vests in the Human yep. Rights Committee, Fine. but not an additional authority. Fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Allison Ampey? Just for clarification, are they actual members of Human Rights mm -hmm. Commission? As I understand, that's what they're looking for. Okay. Yeah. okay. So in it's fact, not a what I understand actually person. is that our new, one of our new appointees, Kathleen, is, I think, has been tapped to be um, one of the people. Mm -hmm. so. okay. All right. So other, again, so no action on this one as well, is what we're saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's bring it to you. Yeah. Great. So okay, good great. work on getting these done, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being I can being cross it off the list of things to do. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Yep. All right. Uh, MASC annual business meeting. Uh, so the resolutions that were in the in Novus were not the full set. Um, but I did, I did just notice that this afternoon and did email that around. Um, and I think we got that in the mail. I haven't been kept, kept up, keeping up with my paper mail, so it's mm, probably yeah. somewhere in a pile in my, in my right. house. But mm -hmm. um, I didn't see anything uh, needed mm. to commenting on this year. Did anybody have any comments mm -hmm. on the resolutions? All right. And so we have to appoint a, uh, what is it called? Delegate. Delegate. Yes, <laughs> that's the word. Is anybody attending that wants to be the delegate? Mr. Schlickman. <clears throat> Move to approve Mr. Schlickman as the Arlington School Committee delegate. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. Superintendent's report. Right. I actually have a, a number of things to talk about this evening. Um, but since we have on the, on the schedule the AHS building project update, let me start with that. We have... Um, since uh, actually early this summer after the override, we have continued in the design process. There have been mm -hmm. numerous meetings uh, as this process, uh, as the uh, project evolves. Uh, what I wanted to mention tonight is that we are at a stage where we're ready to have another community forum mm -hmm. and, and, and 
the purpose of this forum is really just to update the community um, where the project is. Since the last community forum, uh, we have hired a contractor with Consigli, and they have not participated in any forums in the past, and so they are going to present the information that they have at this point in, in terms of phasing of the project. And this, this uh, community forum, which will be uh, moderated by our, our, our chair of the building committee, uh, Jeff Thielman, will be on October 30th at Town Hall from 7 to 8.30. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get information out, um, and uh, the town will help us disseminate that information through that weekly newsletter. But I think it's an opportunity for people to come and hear uh, both the st current status of the design, uh, where we are with um, the, the phasing of this whole project, which we had a meeting about today as well. And, um, you know, I think the parents probably have a lot of questions, and this is an opportunity for them to, you know, to hear where we are. So what's going to happen the rest of the, this fall is that we have a number of meetings um, that we're going, to, we're going to be engaging in about the design, um, the MSBA has us go through a process where we have to look at the design and, and uh, see if there is, you know, uh, it's called the evolution of it in terms of the value engineering of the project, and that is all part of the design process that we go through with MSBA. So we have a meeting, another building committee meeting is coming Tuesday, and in November I think we have probably four scheduled as we, you know, as we get closer to the point where we have to deliver to MSBA, I think it's right before Thanksgiving, uh, um, our design documents. And so that, that process then will move into construction drawings, and as we have told the public, and it is going to happen this way, that we're going to begin construction in March. And we can talk more about that, what the phasing is like um, down the road. March or begin. We are going to be beginning in the pre-construction in pre March. Yes. Pre-construction. Okay. Yes. There's there's a number of things like laying um, utility lines and mm -hmm. creating some additional parking and there's some footings that have to mm -hmm. be put in. There's that that phasing and what's going to happen then is getting more developed all mm -hmm. the time. And to save money, we're going to have some members of the school committee help the digging. Mr. Hainer has a history of digging in front. Yesterday, preparing to put the flags out for Flags for Heroes, I got an emergency phone call that said, somebody's digging up the lawn. And they were out doing test pits yesterday, right in the middle where I'm trying to locate my little plug. So I panicked. And the guy said, if we find any, we'll be careful. And he was very nice. They were very nice. And the facilities people have been very good. Mm -hmm. Ms. Oh, do, can I ask a question about timing? So when will we know sort of more details about the finances in, the, in terms of, like, do we have to make any cuts, mm -hmm. you know? What, what, what timing of that is that? Probably in November. November uh, okay. What's happening? So we should have a recession right now. Pardon? <laughs> Yeah, like I know. Quick, well, before we go out to a quick, four a month thing. recession. Yes, I know. Yeah. Four month recession yeah. right now. <laughs> go no, when we go out to bid. Oh, when we go out to bid. Okay. Bid. <laughs> uh, Bake sales. Which yes. is then? When's the bidding then? Bidding will start next summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. There'll be some things that will happen before because it, oh. you know you, you bid the project, you bid the phases oh, the out as yeah. you go along. Um, as we since. June, there has been a lot of design uh, meetings that have gone on that have been with staff, with the building principal and system principal, you know, just looking at, I mean, even down into the weeds of can you put another desk in this office space, and if you do, where will the plugs be? Or, I mean, it, it really has to get down to that level of detail. That Those designs will go to um, the new, another cost estimating. Mm -hmm. Because as you go through this MSBA process, there's different stages of uh, completed um, completed reports. Or uh, I would say the design the design drawings. You go 60 percent to 90 percent and go forward. 
eventually you're at 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, at each one of those stages, you go through a cost estimating process. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually sort of hard to know what the changes that have been made over the last couple of months uh, as the project evolves, how that's going to get costed out. Because mm -hmm. the last time we did a costing out, it was at the schematic stage, which we had very limited uh, diagrams that it get down into that to that level. So yes, and that's why there's so many meetings in November because you know when we get the cost estimates back mid-November, like the 15th, we have a lot of decisions to make before it goes to MSBA. Got it. All the just to kind of add some context, the uh, you know as Kathy said, we're required by the contract we signed with the MSBA to do. Cost uh, to do value uh, engineering mm -hmm. up until you know it's the end to, to 2024. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so we're required to do that all the time. So we have a process in place in which um, <coughs> the six or seven subcommittees are meeting. They're supposed to be meeting between now and the end of um, between now and early November to frame out <clears throat> what reductions would look like. What would they be there? What would what would they accept or what's what could work? Right. Um, in terms of reduction. So everyone's doing, there's, you know, the committee's supposed to be meeting this month to do that kind of homework mm -hmm. so that we're prepared for November votes. Got it, okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, not, um, some things that we were to eliminate are, are permanent and some things would be alternates that we might take up later on. So we'll just see how, the, I mean, it's, you know, I think people just have to sort of, mm -hmm. we all have to be patient and we don't have any cost estimates back yet. Right. And I think I wasn't um, at the last meeting, which was last week, um, but I think the sense of the committee is that you certainly want, you have a hierarchy of priorities. I mean, the things that you can't change later, those are things you need to make sure you make excellent mm -hmm. decisions about early on. And there are things that you can change, and, and it's, as uh, Mr. Stillman said, as we go through this, this is going to go on the entire length of the project making these decisions mm -hmm. um, because it just, you know, costs change. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I want to address a, a number of things. One is um, the, the recent incident at Odison, just briefly because I, I think at this point everyone is aware of what happened um, to some extent. Uh, that there was some anti-Semitic uh, graffiti. You know, one of the things that uh, that uh, Mr. Maringer, Principal Maringer, sent out to parents, I think, is really true. I mean, these, unfortunately, we're seeing these kinds of incidents throughout our whole country, everywhere. But what really is important is how you respond to them, mm -hmm. and we we can't let these things go because being silent about them just said, well, it's okay, just brush it aside, we're not going to be silent about it. But it, it also is a school, and it's a middle school, and this is a place where um, we, students have to learn and understand the impact of actions, whether they're words or um, written words. And so the, the effort at the middle school is to, um, to help, help students learn from this incident. And uh, certainly it began with meetings at the seventh and eighth grade level um, this week. And the, um, in the Aspire um, meetings that they have with students, they're going to be showing uh, videos from Facing History beginning tomorrow and on Monday. There was a, an IT glitch today that didn't make it possible uh, to move forward with that. But the idea of this is to be an upstander, not a bystander. And that's a theme that is going to resonate through the school. I know that in the seventh grade, uh, there's a book that they read. And again, it's on the same kind of theme, which is warriors do not cry. Again, being, you know, you can't let these things just slide. And, and, and because that's when it becomes the, 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 the new normal. So. Um, you know, we have Ms. Keys here tonight, and I don't know if she, she wants to, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I don't know if she wants to say anything about uh, how this has um, been at the middle school. Um, just that we have great kids. And I think what we sometimes forget is that one thing middle schoolers are really great at is knowing how to push our buttons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they know exactly what to write on the wall to get everybody really upset. And 
I don't see anti-Semitism at the Audison. I, I don't. Um, I see kids liking to make a, make a stir sometimes. Um, I think the response has been completely, completely appropriate. I think the majority of the kids are annoyed by this. Like, why do we have to sit and talk about cultural competency again? We know all these things. We don't say these things. This kid's terrible. That's why we reported it to you. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of the kids who immediately came forward and said, there's something on the bathroom wall. Mm -hmm. It was minutes. Mm -hmm. So we have great kids. And uh, overall, I hope that this doesn't mm -hmm. cloud the perspective of that. Well said. Very, very well said. So we're, we're moving forward, and the school's moving forward together on this. And I, and, and, and I applaud them all for their, their thoughtful response um, to what has happened. And uh, hopefully this will be the last of it. As I said in the press release, as you mentioned, you know they do know the, they do know how to push your buttons, and there's also that element of copycat. And mm -hmm. we're hoping that um, you know once once you give this is the problem. Once you give attention and respond, then the, you encourage other people. Well, let me get their attention again. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, then there's that dilemma: should mm -hmm. you respond or not respond? You know. And so I, I think it's been a, a, as, as thoughtful as it probably could mm -hmm. be in this particular instance. Um, on to another topic, and that is uh, there was an article in the Boston Globe about lunch times in the uh, Arlington Public Schools. Some parents are complaining that we don't have adequate time for students to, um, to eat lunch. And I, I'm actually going to send out a, um, a notice, uh, just a little letter to um, all of our elementary parents because we do not want students to be hungry in our schools. We know mm -hmm. that when that happens, they're not <coughs> going to be receptive to learning. They're not going to be engaged in that process. And actually, over the many years, we have been working to try to make sure that doesn't happen. And I, I want to publicly express our gratitude to Arlington Eats for their partnership in making sure that we have healthy snacks in every building mm -hmm. that's available all day long. And if you go into our schools, in some schools it's a little more obvious that it's there, but, it's, but I, I, every principal knows that that's the case. And, and, and faculty as well. It's, Addison has this, um, this catch of healthy snacks every day for students as well. And there's no teacher who would say, if you're hungry, you have something to eat. Um, we have 40-minute blocks. 20 minutes at a 40 minute block, 20 minutes goes for lunch and 20 minutes for recess. What Arlington Public Schools did a number of years ago, we looked at some research that had been done that actually when you have lunch before recess, kids tend to rush through their lunch and not eat. So whenever we've been able to do that, we've, we've flipped it where they go out to recess first and then lunch so that they're eating more of it. Um, it's always not possible. So if two grades are paired for a lunch, uh, a lunch 40 minute block, mm -hmm. um, they have to flip during the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so that it's sort of divided up a little bit. But the other thing is when they have early lunch, and somebody mentioned kindergarten, when they have an early lunch, which is 1030, though I have to say, having been many years as a teacher, 1030 is when you start to feel ex very hungry, right? Mm -hmm. um, they have afternoon snacks. Uh, that ha just is mm -hmm. part of how it works. So uh, there's really not a way to change. You can't mm -hmm. change the proportion of the 2020 because you have often shared mm -hmm. lunch periods. So, but the important thing is for people to know that we do not want any child to be hungry. If they are hungry, they should eat something and uh, mm -hmm. tell their teacher they need to get a snack. Um, so that's. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that this was uh, a perception of parents, but uh, really the work we've done in the last um, number of years to make sure this doesn't happen has been substantial mm -hmm. and with the support of the Arlington community. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, just a, just a yeah. comment on that. Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, the perception is there because that's what parents think. I mean, it, it, they haven't been clearly told that well, yes, a lot of the schools do send out the notice about the closet of snacks, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that's for people who can't afford the snacks or forget a snack or something. Mm -hmm. It's not for people who were rushed to lunch and didn't get a chance to finish their lunch or eat enough at lunch. So I, I think, I'm happy to look at the, the draft, but I, I think if you, and, and I think some of the teachers, if you ask some of your elementary teachers, they're not here and they're not here, do you always permit your students to have snack? Do they know they're allowed to have snack? Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't. They don't know that they're allowed to have snack if they're hungry. So I, I think this is great. There should be a communication on it. It, also, it should also go to, mm -hmm. to the principals, to the staff. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the it, there are a lot of communication issues in the district, and the perception is there because that's what people think. It's not, you know, there haven't been communicated clearly that snacks are allowed. So this will be a new communication. It's great. Um, but it shouldn't be a big surprise, I think. Okay. Ms. Morgan? So just, and two things, I have lots of elementary students that live in my house. I have one that's at the very early end in first grade. I have two fifth graders, and I think mm -hmm. that it's handled differently even in the elementary schools. Mm -hmm. My fifth graders mm -hmm. came home this year and said, Mom, we can have snack whenever we want now, right? Which I then, that happened, and then I got four text messages from parents who were like, my kids have allergies, and there's all this food in the classroom, and how are they going to stay safe? So it is, it's, it's a little tinder boxy. And so I just think as we talk about it and communicate about mm -hmm. it, we just want to be really careful that we understand what's happening. I um, have not asked my son's first grade teacher, having volunteered weekly in kindergarten last year, I can't imagine if it was a sort of snack. You could have a snack at any time, five-year-olds. I, I don't know. I can tell you that like snack with my kids at my house is very fraught. They want this snack that day. They want to have a snack at 1 o'clock, or they want to have a snack at 2.30, or they want to have a snack at 10. So I, I can't imagine being in a situation, especially K through three or four, where it could be snack free for all. Like if you're hungry, you can have a snack, like probably not, right? Like I don't think we can have kids having mm. snacks all the time or any time they want. Um, so I, I don't know that that's, I just, I think we want to be careful about, or I guess I urge you <coughs> to be careful in thinking about how this is communicated because I do, um, mm -hmm. I think that it's, you know, I think that it's tricky. Does that make sense? Well, yes and yes and no. I, I hear that you're getting different messages as a parent from teachers, or the kids are getting different messages. And does a five-year-old know that if I'm starving, I can have something to eat? Um, and would say something, teacher, that's a good question. I'm not really sure how that I would be. I would, but many others would. But many others would not. Um, it is true that you don't want kids eating all the, you know, throughout the entire day. But I don't. I haven't seen that that much. And I sent out the message that it's going to send, which hasn't been sent yet, to to the principals to see if there was anything inaccurate in it. And um, uh, so there may be more comments when I end this meeting as well, and it may go out tomorrow instead. But um, it's, uh, there is probably no teacher in the district who would want to be knowing that a child is in the class and, and, and hungry. Mm -hmm. Just would not want mm -hmm. that at all and um, would be very sensitive to it. But you're, you're right, the, one of the issues with snacks that are brought from home can be mm -hmm. things that have mm -hmm. to be do with allergies. Mm -hmm. What I have seen from the snacks that we have available, and Aunt Thompson's a really good example of that. In fact, I was just there on Tuesday. You know, you got apples and applesauce, and they're not, they're not necessarily snacks that are going to, they had bags of carrots, I mean, those kinds of things. They're not snacks that are going to are traditionally a, a, cause an allergic reaction. Now, that's not to say there's not children allergic to apples. I, grant, I, get, I get that. So you're right. It is tricky how to balance all these things. And, um, but the one thing that is not going to change in the near future is, is the amount of time that we have in the school day mm -hmm. for lunch. Yeah. And so we're trying to maximize the time we have, be sensitive to this issue of hungry children, and uh, at the same time give them recess as well. Regina? I've been fortunate going into the classroom, mainly the third grade, but with some of the older ones at the elementary level. When they first brought the allegonese, the <coughs> food in, I asked about it. I think we have a phenomenal staff aware of those kids that need 
immediate energy <coughs> aspects to it. As Dr. Bodhi just said, the food that's there is healthy and safe. They're very conscious of that. I've seen kids, while I'm waiting to go in the classroom, kids will walk by, there's the bowl there. They'll just take a piece at all ages. Again, I go along with what you said, Mr. Carden, communication is important that everyone knows it. The teachers are in a constant balancing act of knowing medical histories of kids, who has allergies, who doesn't, watching what's going on in the room. And when I've done presentations in the classroom, kids are very, very respectful. They're not all sitting there lounging and just feasting away. They're, they're respectful. Some kids need that energy boost right then and there. Other kids are aware of it. And it's done very well, I think. Uh, unlike 20 years ago when I was teaching, when somebody would be pulling out something and passing it around to me in a distraction. It's part of the regular program. The teachers are good. Wouldn't hurt just to remind everybody uh, one more time, but I think the I can only speak to the elementary. I, I don't know what goes on at the, the other ones, <laughs> but uh, the, the elementary does an extremely good job, and thanks to the people in the uh, community that have supported this with us. Uh, kudos to them. Yeah, it's kind of a classroom management issue, and that you, the way you structure it in the kindergarten is going to be different than what you're going to do in fifth grade. So it's not going to be a blanket one one size fits all policy. But the other thing that I want to make sure that the parents understand is that a tight control on the amount of time available in the CAF for for lunch is important because you want it to be the right, just it, you have to hit a just right mark. Mm -hmm of long enough that you can get something to eat and eat it, but not so long that they have too much time there and they get bored and antsy and start playing around and it, and it becomes a, a problem. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that, <clears throat> you know, a kid who is repeatedly not getting lunch because it's delayed, you might want to find some way to make sure that the kid gets earlier in the line than later in the line, especially if they're coming in from the playground. If, the, if they have the recess first and the kid doesn't want to come into lunch and is the last one in, yeah, okay, it's, it's going to be an issue. Maybe you have to watch for that. But expanding the lunch period is not a good solution, so it's really up to us to work within the parameters that we've got. I will say that I have observed the lunch lines mm -hmm. in all of our elementary mm -hmm. schools, and I am always impressed at how efficient and fast they are. Mm -hmm. um, the kids are very polite, they <coughs> move along, and I think mm -hmm. the thing I'm even more impressed at is how the elementary students recycle when they, when they finish eating. So they, in that 20 minutes, besides getting their lunch, eating their lunch, they also very orderly will come up and do all the recycling they need to do. Mm. So you're absolutely correct that, you know, what is the sweet spot in terms of time? Um, so it's something that we certainly uh, will continue to look at, and, um, but it's something that we're definitely responding to these concerns and make sure that perhaps the communication is clearer at, and um, we make sure that teachers are more aware of the fact that maybe there are some students in here who haven't, mm. that may be hungry. So anyway, mm -hmm. move, unless there's something else, let me move on to just a couple other things. One, I want to end with a little bit of comments about my trip to Japan. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, uh, before that, I want to mention to parents, I don't know if everybody is fully aware of the fact of, of how many parent community forums the Arlington Public Schools sponsors every year. And there are a number, sometimes they're very well um, attended. Um, we will send reminders out, but there are a lot of them that are quite uh, apropos to some of the issues to, going on right now. So, for example, um, on the 15th, mm -hmm. which is next week, actually it's 15th, 22nd, 29th, and this November 5th, mm -hmm. there's Guiding Good Choices. Then there is, on the 23rd, Building community to support the LGBTQIA and youth. And then there's vaping on the 16th. The vaping alarm has rung. So on our website, on the quick links, if you went to community, uh, parent community forums, you would get the complete list of all of these. 
and I, I urge you to do it because some of these are, are really um, important opportunities for parents to learn about some of these issues that their children are facing. Uh, but also along those lines, there is another community conversation that's going to be scheduled next Tuesday um, on the, that is the six, is that the 16th? It's a Thursday, I thought it was Thursday. Hold on, 17th, Thursday the 17th. It's Thursday the 17th. <coughs> oh, I'm gonna send it out, I, I thought it was Tuesday. Thursday the 17th. Tuesday, uh, Thursday the 17th, all right. Um, and this is gonna be a, uh, a, a community conversation on, again, LGBTQ issues in, and it's going to be at the Robbins Library at I believe it's at, it's at 630, 6.30, right, on the fourth floor, floor fourth right. Floor. Yeah. But I'll, I'll be sending reminders out to parents on that as well. So I just wanna give you some, you know, just sort of uh, a quick um, overview of the, the 35th anniversary celebration in Japan. Um, we had a small delegation go, just like they brought a small delegation here in April. It was myself and the town manager and three of the people who, who organized the student visits when they come here, as well as help support the, the visit to Japan uh, from Arlington in July. It was a, just a remarkable trip. I, I think the, 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 the common theme that was discussed with the school officials, the town officials and teachers was how important these sister city relationships are, um, not, certainly for the adults, but for our students. Uh, we have anywhere from 20 to 24 students come here in the spring for 10 days in which they interact with our students and they are in host families. And it has created some bonds that remain um, so significant. In fact, when we were there, um, three of the people that were organize this, have been host parents for a number of years, six, seven years. Um, and we had a night where we could meet with some of the students. And I walked in and one of the students just, from Japan, just burst into tears. She was so thrilled to see the person she had stayed with. And, and this, that was 10 years ago. So these relationships remain very strong and and really uh, are transformative in terms of your, your worldview and your view of another culture. And that's the whole purpose of, the, of these sister cities is that we, we learn um, to understand another culture more closely. We develop these, uh, these stronger um, bonds between them. And as my counterpart in, um, said, this is how we're going to achieve world peace is through these kinds of exchanges with students because then they can, they can have an appreciation of the world. And so if anything, it's the trip affirmed certainly my commitment and the, the commitment of the district to maintain, to maintain this very special relationship. Um, this is the 15th, last year was the 15th year of the, the, the students coming here and and we, we have students going there. The, uh, we, got an, we got an opportunity to experience something with our students, uh, maybe a little bit different. We spent a half day in three different schools, uh, which was terrific. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that in a second. But we also got to see some of the shrines and, and understand the importance of shrines and just the, all of the, um, the customs and um, rituals that are part of every Japanese family. So when you go to schools, you know, some things are universally the same, and that's children, particularly at the elementary. You know, they're just so enthusiastic and so happy to see you, and you know, uh, it was just wonderful. Um, their schools physically are different than ours. They're more of an, like in a California kind of style where you have a building and then a walkway and then another building. Um, and it works because their, their weather isn't quite as extreme as ours for as long as ours is. I will say it was quite warm there. It was in the 80s all the time. Um, and when our students go in July, it's in the, often in the 90s. 
and our, their students are in school. Mm -hmm. So we go in July because they're still part of their, their summer session. I mean, not their summer, they, they divide the year into trimesters. So there are a lot of similarities just on people to people level. Uh, another big similarity is their junior high band is excellent. And so I, I know they, when they come here, they, they see our middle school band, which is excellent. And so there's something that's very similar. Um, I will say one difference between their band and ours is that there's more girls yeah. in, the, in the Japanese band. Hmm. Um, and they, uh, really, we were, we were spellbound by their performances. Um, but there are differences, too. And one is, the obvious one is they wear uniforms. And, and, and I saw this in Kyoto and other, in Tokyo, too. It's the same uniform. It's navy blue um, for the girls' skirts and for the boys' pants, uh, or sometimes dark gray and white shirts and they all wear the same thing, which uh, in that kind of a situation, it's, you know, you, the, the teacher said they loved having uniforms because there was no differentiation about the differences in economic background. Another big difference is they, they stay in their classroom uh, and teachers move. They eat in their classroom. So the food is delivered to the classroom, and we went down to the kitchen, and, and I actually have a picture that's really, I should, probably should have put up a slideshow together for you, but the, they're in, they look like they're in hazmat suits <laughs> with gloves and masks and white. I mean, everything is in white, and they deliver the food to the, to the classrooms, and they, the kids just you know, pass out the food. And there is, a, there is a rule that you have to eat everything and you don't return your platter without everything eaten. Um, and one of the big, uh, one of the, this was actually a huge initiative in uh, uh, the town this year from the mayor that he wanted to have uniform hot lunches for all kids. Um, though interesting, uh, we were asking some of the students, because we ate with them, whether they liked that, and they said, they because they used to have bring lunch from home, and some of them admitted they liked having their lunch from home more than they liked to have this uniform lunch every day. But I, again, I, I was impressed at how nutritious it was and how large it was, I must say. They did not, by the way, have much more time to eat than, um, than, <laughs> than we have. Uh, and they go out for recess. Another difference is that kids stay after school uh, for a much longer day. Um, they don't leave until 4.30, 5 o'clock. Most of them are playing some kind of a sport or engaged in some kind of physical activity or some, some type of um, I don't know, club or even a learning opportunity. For one of the learning opportunities is, and this is very popular in, at the middle school level, um, they call it junior high, is learning the formal tea process. Um, I didn't, however, see any young boys <laughs> learning it. They were all girls learning it, but they, they have things like that. And they wanted to show us one of the other, um, uh, one of the other activities they had was archery. And they had, I don't, I, hopefully there's no pictures of Adam and I. <laughs> oh, good. Good to see that one. Doing this. I could barely pull the bow back. The bow was as, as big as I was. And uh, they do that, and uh, they, they put on a demonstration, and they were quite good. Um, there was a wonderful relationship between teachers and students there. You could see that. Um, and uh, certainly all the administrators I met were all very child-focused. The other thing they do do is they have a lot of change. Uh, an administrator doesn't stay in a school more than two years, three mm -hmm. years maybe. And they just rotating people around all the time. They're assigned by the prefecture. Yeah, around the prefecture too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get moved anywhere else in Kyoto Prefecture. It, mm -hmm. They don't belong to the the, the city. Especially the, well, the high school for sure. The and high school, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it was um, it was wonderful. We had a formal dinner, just like we've had a formal dinner here. Um, and, and the U.S. Consul 
for the Osaka Kyoto Prefecture came with a couple of their s staff people. They actually have hired staff people on the consulate to manage sister cities hmm. because there are a lot of U.S. or, uh, for that matter, um, European, um, South Australian sister city arrangements in, in uh, Japan. So the fact that there's so many, they hired somebody to manage this who came to the dinner. Um, well, for example, I mean, Boston's sister city is Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Now, Boston has 10 sister cities. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we have one. <laughs> two. two. We have two. Yeah. What's the other one? The other one's in Kiyosente. Oh, that's right, Kiyosente, mm -hmm. right, right, that's right, absolutely right. Kiyosente we have. Um, of course I know that. So, um, anyway, I, if you want to go, the students go in July, mm -hmm. and I know you would be certainly welcome to join the, join the group. Uh, I don't think we will have a, another exchange like this for five years, mm -hmm. but there are already people talking about the 40th, and uh, the last time we went as a delegation was at the 25th, so there was some plans around the 30th, but it didn't quite happen. So, um, happy to talk more about it if, another time if you'd like. It was Anyone wonderful. who wants to go, we can recommend Sonoe's Hotel. And Sonoe's Hotel, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Sonoe is the person who organizes um, the students coming here She's really the program organizer. And by the way, while we were there, they were doing the interviewing. They had a lot of applications, mm -hmm. and the, they had 57 finalists, and they narrowed it down to 20. Mm -hmm. And so for the next six months, they will be preparing. They will be taking extra English classes, learning, you know, hi learning their, their um, history of the United States a little bit more. One of the things that actually surprised me, when they come, you've seen them dance. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, they, they do this choreography in six months? Well, it turns out it's not exactly the case. Mm -hmm. When we went to the junior high, they did a performance for us um, in which the entire school, mm -hmm. over four, there were like 400 kids in the, in the uh, gym, did the dance. Mm -hmm. So this is actually part of their mm -hmm. um, arts program. Mm -hmm. So they, and they, the songs that kids sing, mm -hmm. they, were, they sang those songs. So they don't, their six months preparation is less about that part of it as it is about learning about the United States. Mm -hmm. That's it. Great. Yeah. All right. Consent agenda. All items listed are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event each item will be considered in its normal sequence. Can you pull the trips? Well, trips. we already voted one of the trips. Mm -hmm. Well, whichever one you didn't vote. Sure. And we're not doing the minutes, Karen, or? No. 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 Okay. So it's just the warrant, approval of warrant, warrant number 20066, two, two dated 10 1 2019, amount 387522 mm -hmm. So moved. So moved. Second. Just a correction. I, on the warrant, I thought it was dated 10 15, and this says yeah, 10 be, 1. No, be, no, this is the one yes. we're no, voting on. the one we signed last time. Got it. Thank you. Mm. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Unanimous. Uh, so the South Africa trip? Did you have yeah, I just, I, am, I find it really problematic that we support trips that cost $4,150. Um, they're advertised at school. There are flyers. There are <clears throat> information nights that happen in our schools. Um, I can tell you there is no way that any of my children would ever be able to attend that kind of a trip, and I don't know that that's necessarily the litmus test for whether or not we run them, but I know if my kids can't go, a lot, a lot of kids also can't go. Um, and I'm just, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that we send um, Arlington Public School employees as chaperones who go, and to me it makes it feel 
you know, access to teachers and staff is one of the most important things for um, students. And, you know, I don't think that there's a lack of that. I think that the vast, vast majority of faculty and staff spend an inordinate time with our kids, but this to me feels kind of like pay to play. And uh, so I don't like it. And so I'm gonna vote against this one. So I wanted to pull it off. Okay. Thanks. Um, all right, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any abstentions? Any op opposition? Okay, Mr. Hayner and Ms. Morgan, any abstentions? Okay. You got all that, Karen? Yeah. Great. Uh, discussion of district goals and evidence, evidence and superintendent evaluation process. So, uh, it's time to evaluate the superintendent. Um, we actually no <laughs> longer have the schedule in our policy, but following the old schedule, we're supposed to just be doing it for, at, for the next, uh, for the evaluation forms to be returned at the next meeting, the second meeting mm -hmm. in October. Mm -hmm. with the old policy, mm -hmm. um, but we can push that a little bit. It's not a big deal. Right. But end of the mm -hmm. month is really like the, the goal. We don't have the forms yet, right? No, we don't have the forms okay. yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we don't have the evidence. We don't have the evidence. We don't have the evidence yet. We don't have the evidence. I didn't miss anything. We don't have the evidence. So um, I just wanted to discuss when we wanted when we want to get items, how we want to get items. Karen is asking about, I guess, uh, Rod's assistant is doing it this year. Um, but she's asking about whether we want everything in Novus, or if I suggested if something is you know huge, maybe we can just have a paper copy. But we're not, it's not clear what the evidence is yet. So, um, there, can I speak? Sure. Go ahead. So the evidence we have collected, it, they're in files. Mm -hmm. Some of it uh, was submitted electronically, and some of it <coughs> not. So however you want it to be submitted, um, what's best convenient for you? That's what we'll do. Mr. Hainer? I, I personally would like it electronically, so if I want to refer to a piece in the evaluation, I can cut and paste it as opposed to, uh, it, it, it would be efficient for me. I, I don't know how much extra work that is for you folks. Uh, if it's a lot of work, I, I can do the typing, but if it can be provided electronically, I would appreciate okay. that. Anybody else have? I, 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 Novus worked really well, I thought. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, a hundred-page document obviously would be annoying. So <laughs> it's going to be no, but it is going to be probably what? more than that. Well, to in total, but I mean, it, you don't want well, any individual document to be that big necessarily. But right, it's going to be well, a large doc. I just well, want to. Oh, all well, together, yes. I no, I get that. No, no, I'm saying each. I, I hopefully they would be individual documents. I don't want it, uh, one file. Yes, right? we have like yeah. cover sheets, and we'll put them in there. Like individual by boom, content boom, boom, area. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just need to know like what are the how you want it organized, and I will make sure that it's organized that way. Mr. Hainer, yes. I, it seems each year that we get more and more and more uh, where we were hoping to get, to, at least I was hoping to get specifics based on, on the goals that we were discussing and things of that nature. I, I just find it, oh, fine, I'll take whatever it is and go through it. Yeah, I mean, there, there are only certain goals that are that we're evaluating you on. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So if you could. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Um, I, I, I think that this is something that we need to take another look at, and I would suggest having some kind of retreat before we begin the next goals process. Um, and we can, you know, certainly talk about it, refine what we're doing. I think it's a good time. I think it's a good and appropriate thing to do. All right, any other? So as far as timing, go ahead, Mr. Hainer. I want to say, you, you, you extended the t time for us to turn it into you. Uh, do we have a specific date of when we're going to do? Uh, well, I, we I, set the date. Want, I wanted to find out when yeah. materials will be available, when the narrative will be available. Um, certainly, probably, the weekend after next. I mean, the following week, early part of the week, I can get to it. I haven't done much on it yet. We're working on, Karen and I were working on what all of the different things we want to put into NOVA so that you have that information. Um, and the information that Dr. McNeil's talking about is just all of the evidence from, from the <laughs> curriculum leaders 
of the work that they have done. But there are more than just that particular goal. There are all the other goals that we have. But for example, one of the, the district goals had to do with um, hiring practices and diversity reports. So, I mean, that report you saw to, you had tonight, that will be something that can be uploaded. Many of these things you've already heard about, seen over the course of the year. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to sort of have it all sort of put back together again. Um, last year, it was a, we made a, a real effort to make sure that people were in to talk to you so you could see what, hear what they were doing. And so you're getting pretty much um, sort of some reason of, of all that. We, we have two meetings dedicated to the budget in December. We have two meetings scheduled back to back in November. So correct me if I'm wrong, it's going to be, have to be one of those two meetings in November. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. To do it. Yes. So it'll yes. probably be we'll the, get it in, yes. the you'll, 21st. You'll talk, you'll talk to Karen and you'll give us a deadline of uh, when you want to start. So mm -hmm. yes. it sounds like maybe that um, Dr. Brady can get us the narrative, which I think mm -hmm. I'd like to see first before mm -hmm. delving oh, yes. into things. May, by looks like the early part of the week of the 21st. Mm -hmm. Does that sound like mm -hmm. good timing? Mm -hmm. um, and then we could maybe get things to you like by the 31st. So I'm just th throwing out random dates <laughs> to be discussed on the 14th. Or maybe maybe the 31st is too. Discussed, is, discussed on the 14th? If we're not getting the documents till the 31st, we have to put it out. No, no. We, we would have to give, I mean, 31st, maybe you, you, we can, you can give us more time, but we would get you our comments by the, yeah. or by, or by, so, maybe yeah. by so Monday if, the 4th. If, or yeah, so if we're not, yeah, if we're not actually reporting on the evaluation until the 14th, yeah. then, then it, it can be into be November 5th or something for right. the deadline. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that seems like the good Thank right you. timing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear, the, the way that the documents will be submitted will be by the district goals from last year. Mm -hmm. And they will be, uh, have in individual folders based upon, and, and they will be labeled by content. They have evidence cover sheet that describes, that has, describes the actions, the rationale, and the uh, description of the evidence. Thank that you. will be uploaded into Novus, and that's the way you would like to have it. Fine with me. No good way. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that correct? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's always awkward because there are district goals don't really work as well with the evaluation thing. Nope. But it sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Just pull good. this off mm -hmm. every year. And, and they're going to be, as no Dr. Bode alluded to, they're basically supporting the presentation that the mm -hmm. curriculum leaders came I'm not gonna even and be gave <laughs> last spring. Especially so those were connected to the district goals. It's not okay. All right. Anything else? Uh, no policy. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. So, budget. So we had our meeting last week. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Mason was ill and Dr. Buddy was in Japan, so it was just us. Uh, but we did discuss the budget calendar of which you have a draft version in your um, packet ish here and we'll approve that next week but that's just if anyone notices anything tell me um, we also discussed f we're going to be working on the format and timing of the currently monthly budget reporting we think it can be somewhat less frequent um, and we'll be meeting again in the next couple weeks and then I need um, I realized something when I was sitting here that we had talked at our last meeting about enrollment and when I talked to Mr. Mason because after our meeting because he wasn't able to attend, I talked to him and he mentioned that the consultant that he was looking into has a deadline of October 20th to get into this cycle. And I'm concerned that our next meeting isn't for two weeks and if we need to approve budget for hiring the consultant, um, it seems like we need to do it now. And I know we don't have any information. I mean, he was going back to them and getting a new estimate and I don't know what that was, but I'm just wondering what do we want to do? Do we want to try and 
guests and give the superintendent approval to spend a certain amount? Do we need to wait? You know, do we want to beg them to give us five days and and um, well, I, think, I just don't know. Yeah. I, I, mean, I think unless it requires a budget transfer, mm -hmm. then it's within this, the administration's mm -hmm. authority okay. yeah. to yeah. contract okay. for that. Mm -hmm. And okay. you know, we usually we usually don't even approach budget transfers until much later in the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not an issue. Let's rewind. I, I, what he's going back is that they gave an estimate of a of amount for every for five years, and I said we just need to have. We're going to do a one year, which is 12500 Now, whether that's going to change or not, I don't know. We want, we want to have a, a forecast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can do later on see how the forecast matches to actuals. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we need to have a reforecast every year for five years. And that's what my understanding was, what the proposal was. So that's what he's going back to talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, policies and procedures. We have a doodle out. Oh, great. And we're <laughs> going to schedule a meeting. Uh, CIAA. We are going to meet on October 24th at 5:45 before our school committee meeting. Oh. Okay. Community relations. Uh, we met uh, briefly to interview some candidates for the school committee's representation for TAC. Um, we have a candidate to bring to the committee, but um, timing being what it was, we have to, we have to wait till next time. So okay. Hopefully we can create that. Oh, and then also we are, have a doodle out for a meeting on after school issues uh, where we are continuing to grapple with issues both big and small in our district. Okay. Facilities? Nothing to report. Uh, legal services? Nothing to report. Building committee, we already covered. Calendar committee. I, I think administration is sending out a doodle soon. All right. Uh, election modernization committee. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, uh, no, we haven't met since we last. Okay. Uh, we have a meeting coming up. Uh, superintendent search process. We also have the doodle out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And negotiation, nothing. Any liaison report? Uh, go ahead, Sue. Uh, so I went to visit Stratton. Stratton's my you know, sort of liaison relationship, and um, had a great conversation with the PTO there. Um, they echoed Ms. Markin's concern about the way that um, classroom uh, data is presented, that it's sort of because they have such an, a strong, a large SLC program, it looks like they have smaller classrooms than they really do. So that was actually a common concern among people at the PTO. Um, other things were, you know, kindergarten cutoff time, um, uh, questions about the high school, um, library, oh, oh, library books or books for new teachers. They felt that there was a need to have more readers. Um, so those were the things we discussed. Great. Um, just an update from the AEF. Um, uh, they'll be announcing a. a an additional funding of, of the SEL um, grant, social emotional learning grant. But one thing I was excited about was that Sarah Bird it was did attend our meeting and talked about doing a parent university oh, uh, program in the spring and in, in looking or in March or some sometime in that year. So that'd be something very exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to all the community forums you talked about, uh, like a day long parent university that other towns have had. On um, everything or in. No, and social emotional social learning emotional, type, okay. type stuff. <coughs> Any other liaison? Of course. All right. Uh, announcements. You don't have any announcements, Bill? None tonight. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's after 938. All right. That was all announcements. Future agenda items. <coughs> Great. We do not have executive session. So. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we're adjourned. Mm -hmm.